and the Applications Committee on the 16th of December 2014. Could I ask, make sure all everyone's got their mobile phones switched off, and I'd like, to, uh, just like everyone to know that the, meet, this, the meeting may be recorded and subsequently made available for, to, to the public for listening purposes. Uh, could I ask Gillian uh, for uh, apologies and say them? Thank you, Chair. Yes, we are quoted. We have 16 members present, and we have one apology from Councillor Jiggers. Thank you. That's it. Um, Councillor Hislop hopes to be here very shortly. Is there any declarations of interest? Sorry, Thanks, Stephen. It was just to inform you that Councillor Dick is also oh, likely to be here. Have you got any declarations of interest? Maybe. I can tell the chair the, when I used to work here years ago, I uh, worked for this gentleman and I've known him for a long time. Councillor Witts. Also, item 12, Chairman, I, I, I know the applicant. Uh, also, um, the uh, application is contained within the NIST Scenic Area, and I am Chairman of the NIST Scenic Area Advisory Group. But I do not consider that interest to be necessary for the group to leave the domain closed. Jim. Uh, thanks, Chair. Item 8. I know the organisation. I have met with the uh, community liaison group. Uh, I've spoken at the liaison group. I've spoken to the organisation in relation to community benefits, also the community, etc., etc. And I feel that it's appropriate that uh, in these circumstances I declare an interest to take no part in the decision making that comes to the application. And I'll be vacating the chair on item 11. And as I say, I know the applicant's too stunned, but I don't think it's a material. Consideration. Uh, uh, Andy. Um, thanks, Chair. Um, item six, the Garrick, uh, the Fuji Hospital. I'm the council's representative on the Public Health Committee, but uh, I don't see that will have any bearing on, on, on matters going forward. But I'm uh, happy to repair that anyway. Yeah. Any more? Tom. Then uh, item number. Well, I know the applicant, he was on the council with me for a number of years, but uh, it won't make any difference to my uh, deliberations, so I won't be leaving the meeting. No. Jim. Thanks, Chair. Just on, on the back of Councillor Ferguson, said I'm the Chair of the Integration Board now, and I'm sure it'll make no difference to my the position here, but just as a matter of public record, uh, I have an association with the Health Care Committee from the back. Thank you, Jim. So, the minutes of the previous the previous meeting. Could I ask uh, Gillian, could you outline the procedures for the, to be followed? Thank you, Chair. Yes, the Planning Applications Committee will consider each application in turn as detailed on the agenda. The case officer or other appointed officer will make a short presentation addressing the determining issues accompanied by digital images. Any late information, amendments or corrections will be reported at this time. Members may ask questions of officers following the presentation on points of clarification. The chairman has been provided with a list of eligible representatives who have registered to speak at this meeting within the period specified in council policy. No other persons will be allowed to speak. The chairman will individually invite those who have registered in advance to speak to make their presentation, after which they may be questioned by committee members. No questions may be asked of members. The order of eligible parties being heard will be as follows. Third parties objecting to an application, third parties supporting an application, statutory consultees objecting to an application, elected members of Dumfries and Galloway Council who are not members of the Planning Applications Committee, and then applicants or their agents. Representers have been placed in alphabetical order and a copy of the public speaking list is available from the committee officer taking notes of our proceedings.
Presentations will be strictly limited to three minutes per person, except for national and major development, which by their very nature are more complex, where the time limit will be five minutes. The chairman of the committee will ask you to come to a conclusion if you take too long. Representers are encouraged to use the time allocated to clarify any points they consider material and address the determining issues. Certain matters are not normally material planning considerations and will not be taken into account by the Council when, de when deciding on a planning application. Representers should not raise any new matters without explaining why they were not raised earlier with the case officer. Please do not repeat what is in the report as members will ha have already read this report. After all the representations have been heard, the meeting is then in formal session and no members of the public may address the committee from the public gallery. The Planning Applications Committee will then proceed to determine the application. Thank you. Thanks, Gillian. we go to item uh, four on the agenda. It's the... Sorry. Just, thank you, Chair. Just to clarify, um, item numbers four and five are both matters that um, have been heard previously and were um, deferred for further investigation. Therefore, only the members who were present at the previous hearing will be able to determine um, the application for item four and item five. Thank you. I'll go to item four, the erection of a dwelling house at Hookerai's Port Patrick, uh, reference number 13, stroke P, stroke one, stroke 030, as I say, as members who were in session, I'll ask the plan to go through the to, through the slides, and then we'll take go through there. But we're in session. Excuse me, Chair. Okay. I'll get Councillor Blake. Councillor Blake. Yeah, just before we start, would you mind going through the, the names of the councillors that are eligible to sit in this? Yes, um, Councillor Blake, that's no problem. It is Councillor Dempster, Councillor Blake, Councillor Carruthers, Councillor Dick, Councillor Dryborough, Councillor Geddes, Councillor Gilroy, Councillor Groom, Councillor Hislop, Councillor Maitland, Councillor McCautry, Councillor McComb, Councillor McKee, Councillor Ogilvie, Councillor Thompson and Councillor Witt. That is for item four. Thank you. Thank you. Ronnie. <coughs> Just a point of clarification. Was this from the last meeting? I wasn't present at the last uh, planning committee meeting. Neither was Ian Dick. It was Councillor Ogilvy. It was from the May, uh, May, May committee. That's fine. Sorry. Apologies. Right. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, just a brief recap on the slides, which you would have seen earlier. This is a repeat of the same presentation. Uh, the application site is just on the uh, easternmost uh, outskirts of Port Patrick. Uh, the road at the top right-hand corner being the, uh, the A77 as it descends uh, into Port Patrick. And then you'll see on, uh, then as you enter, there's like a series of cul-de-sacs on your right, and the site is amongst those. Uh, the site being at the end of the uh, cul-de-sacs there. And, with, and it being a traditional suburban type layout. The uh, plot itself is uh, an amenity area um, left over from the previous development. The applicant wants to erect a dwelling on it. Uh, this is the indicative plan showing how a dwelling on the site could be sited. Uh, this is the actual um, area involved at the head of the, of the turning head. As you can see, there's like a, just a rough shrubbery uh, and it just forms like a visual gap between two existing dwellings. Uh, just, just slightly uh, closer up, just uh, seeing the nature of the ground cover there. And just a bit, a bit further again, um, just showing the, the nature of, of the uh, site and, it sort of, uh, and, and the ground texture. The, the, the front half being gravel and the second half just behind that, that Cotoniaster hedge uh, just going more into like shrubbery and, to, and into young trees. The uh, footpath along the, the, on the left of the slide there is a footpath linking the cul-de-sac head to the next road along, which is, which is called Gold, Golf Course Road. Uh, this is the reverse view. Sorry, we seem to have lost the slides. 
dwelling house on the west and the application site, which um, has access to a field. Um, few next few sites are just some photographs of the site. So this is the site with a Scottish water pumping station situated at the front of it, and this is the access road to the field is on the right hand side of the slide. Um, this was the pumping station, um, the close above it of the photograph. This is what's at the front of the site. This is the property to the to the east, number forty seven. This is the dwelling house to the west, number forty nine. And this is the application site, um, looking southeast across it, um, that's looking towards the adjoining property on the eastern side, number 47. It's a close-up of the boundary treatment with number 47, which is a 1.6 metre high fence. Looking north across the site, uh, that would be looking roughly where the rear of the dwelling house would be. Close up of the rear boundary with number 49 with the access road in between. Um, that shows the width of the access road situated between the two um, proposed sites in the existing house. And this is the field at the back uh, to the south of the site. And wider views of George Douglas Drive. This is looking east and west. And as you can see, it's very much predominantly characterized by single story uh, dwelling houses. In terms of the proposed uh, plans, this is a proposed uh, site plan showing the layout of the development, the two car parking spaces at the front. Um, these are the proposed elevations of the, of the dwelling house, and in the context of the street scene, uh, that's the, the central um, house is what's proposed, so that's how it would read in the context of the street scene. Um, these are the proposed floor plans. And just to recap on the previous uh, site plan for the approval of the scheme, this was what was approved uh, back in the late 90s, early 2000s when this scheme was approved. So it shows what the application site was intended to be when it was, uh, when it was, when it was approved. And this is the Dumfries Open Space Strategy from a, uh, an update from when this application was previously um, put before members. This has actually been made statutory guidance now and it shows the proposed site, but it also shows all the allocated areas of open space in the locality, which this site doesn't uh, form part of that. And just to show the other open space areas in the locality, this connects to the largest of those, Hamilton Stark Park. Um, further along the street, there's a, an access to that. And then Priestons Drive, there's a, a toddler's play area as well as an, an amenity green space area. So in conclusion, um, officers are of the opinion that uh, this application complies with the local development plan policies and is recommended for approval. Thanks, so Andrew. Gentlemen. Members, David. Just ask a question here. Uh, the farmer's access into his field and the proposed access for this house, what, what wood has the farmer got and what wood has left? access into the field and given the uh, is it a pumping station that he say was there what what about pipe work is there any pipe work that's likely be, to be affected by this access and by building in there and um, scottish water were consulted on the application and raised no objections so i would presume that they would look at that in their consultation response um and the access would have to go through a road opening permit um, which would have to be applied for, which would look at the construction methods of that. So that would be a separate process. And if you give me two seconds, I can uh, measure the proposed access width and the existing access width. So just while Andrew's measuring that, you can see that on the left-hand side of that slide, the, the access road is going to be retained. So there's no intention to remove that whatsoever. Tom. Uh, th thanks, uh, Chair. Matt, I've got very grave misgivings about this application. I wonder if we can go back to the previous slide where planning permission was granted uh, back in 97, I think it was. Right. If you, if you notice, that actually says open space, because I would see it at the time, and I would see it at the previous application, what I take umbrage at, it's just because our guys who made up the local development plan forgot to include that as open space, doesn't they make it right? That is open space. 
I'll refer you to uh, one, two, and it's the third note uh, point down, where a similar unused and untidy piece of land in Atkinson Road was developed. That bit of land in Atkinson Road was adopted by Nisdale District Council in 1987 as the open space as decreed by the planning committee at that time. Why it was subsequently sold, and indeed I, I just wonder if the seller even had the right to sell it, because as far as I'm aware, Nisdale District Council adopted that. Nisdale District Council maintained it. This was the successor council in Nisdale District Council, and certainly when I came off the council in 2007, it maintained it. So I don't know who sold it, whether it was this council or some acting for R&D, maybe was still holding the title deeds, which she shouldn't have had. But when that was given, this second development in George Douglas Drive was given permission, it's quite clear that was open space. Now at that time, the builders then decided they didn't want to give commuted summons to the council for the council to adopt open space, so they decided they would maintain it themselves one way or another. And that was usually by putting something in the title deeds, because there are similar R&D developments elsewhere in that area where the people have to pay to some, uh, I think it's several uh, developments, to have the, the ground maintained. And the, 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 the figure they've got to pay is fixed by the company. They've no got very much say in it. But what, what I do take objection to, we, we keep quoting this local development plan that says there is uh, no open space there. For that very clearly, when that was granted planning permission, says open space. Now, just because our planners who prepare the local development plan are a bit sloppy and don't do their homework, that is no reason that is no reason to say that that is not open space. So I'm just a wee bit uh, annoyed at the way this has been handled. As far as I'm concerned, that was open space for public community and has been for, for many, many a long year. And I'm just really, really annoyed that this has actually come back to this. David? If Andrew can just go back to the slide which shows the uh, supplementary guidance. When the open space strategy was done, what was looked at was significant, meaningful areas of open space. There are lots of little patches of open space throughout the area, and obviously it's not possible to go and identify every single bit of that. There, I mean, uh, we share the, some of the concern about the situation we find ourselves in here, um, with the, the fact that this was identified in 1999 as open space. The fact of the matter is the developer didn't get the council to adopt that land. It then, when the company went into receivership, has now obviously been sold off to a third party. And we're now left with an application for a house in that. It's one of those ones where we've looked through it and we can't find any policy justification to refuse it, but I can't say that means that we're necessarily overjoyed about the, the prospect of it. Tom? In, in which case, I mean, it, it reinforces my point. There's probably no, no much point in uh, designating areas of open space. A few years later, we can just uh, ignore the fact that we're designated by planners of open space. I'm, I'm quite prepared to move that this be refused on the grounds that uh, it uh, takes away the immunity from the area and it should be redesignated as an open space. Ian? I can, pick up, I can understand some of the points that Councillor McCocker is making, but in regards to the reason I was looking for this to be deferred last time, certainly was around about to get, to get the clarification, was it open space or was it not? And because of representations, I thought it was further information supplied at the time, that should identify that it would have been uh, deemed as open space. But I think just for, just for clarity uh, for Mr. City in regards to the open space, is it, it, I think what you're saying there, David, is it's absolutely not open space because, and I think, I agree with, a bit again with what Councillor McCorkery is saying in regards to it, I feel it should have been picked up under local development plan because there's quite a lot of these across the police and Galway, not just certainly here, small places. So I'm just wondering how many have we out so much as it goes across, not for this committee, obviously it's for the E and I committee or the full council to consider that. But in regards to that, and, and what's, again, go back to the question asked in the previous one, what's actually an offer here in, in regards to a community sum? Just to make sure we're absolutely clear on that point. Well, again, really just to reiterate that there was a substantial piece of work done to, for the open space strategy, and it really was looking at the significant areas. There will always be little packet, pockets of um, either amenity open space or um, very small areas of usable play parks, which just haven't been identified right across the area. And that was deliberately. It wasn't a case that was being sloppy. It was a case that they were only looking at the, the significant areas. So that's the, the area that you can see on the plan there. There is a substantial area of open space in and around it. Um, in terms of the planning permission that was granted, uh, the uh, 
about 2010, that clearly identifies on the plan which you saw up on the screen. It was shown originally as open space, but situations have moved on since that, and we've had long discussions with our colleagues in the development plan section on was there not something that we could do about this? Was there something about commuted payments? And that set out in the report. The short answer is no, we can't do so. And that's the difference between the previous application and this one, that whilst the previous application there was on the table, actually under the old development plan, because it went to the May Committee, um, a proposal to do that. Subsequently, things have moved on. And with this application, when it went to, um, correct me if I'm wrong, was it the October Committee? Yep. Then by that time, the, the LDP was in place, and it really wasn't appropriate for us to have sought a commuted sum. So whilst there's similarities between the two proposals, the, the timing is also critical. Ian? Yeah. Thanks for the clarity. In regards to that, I would, just, I would move the recommendations, Chair. Alistair? Thanks, sir. I'll second that. Ian? Yeah. I mean, uh, <laughs> Stephen? Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> I think that the area that actually concerns me is that under starting at 4.6 on page 32 um, is that when it was originally approved, the 27 dwelling houses, there was a designated uh, part of the, the site layout, um, which was open space. And then subsequently, as you go through the sort of narrative there, um, given that the council didn't accept responsibility for the future maintenance of that, the developer was meant to provide evidence of the agreement to maintain the open space. So that was a condition. Uh, and then subsequently you read that there was no such case file of any agreement being submitted. And clearly the development has gone ahead, uh, I would presume, given there was houses there. So I think the concern there is how we actually follow up the conditions we set, um, which leaves me in a very, you know, I, I, I can't really go with the recommendations as such because there's this sort of untangled knot um, left behind in the legacy of this development. So it's very hard to just sort of say, well, they didn't do it, we didn't follow it up, so let's just bash on anyway. And I don't, I'm not really comfortable with that approach. That's all I'd like to add, thank you. I think the problem we've got as well, Stephen, is the developer now is no longer. So that, that's, a, that's a problem we've got there as well, like can't really follow it up. Right, we've, got a, we've got a proposal. Yeah, I'm quite happy to second Councillor McCulkey's motion. David. Could I get a response to the planner regarding the width of park deck, please? Andrew. Yeah. The uh, field access has a width of five metres. The proposed access has a width of four metres. Gillian, you've got a proposal. Thank you, um, Chair. We have a motion by Councillor Carruthers, seconded by Councillor Geddes, to approve um, subject to the conditions as detailed in the report. We have an amendment by Councillor McCautry, seconded by Councillor Blake, to refuse on the grounds um, of the poor level of amenity um, and the removal of an area of open space um, originally identified um, within the planning permission from 99 oblique P oblique 3 oblique 0067. Councillor Martin. Amendment. Councillor Dempster. Motion. Councillor Blake. Amendment. Councillor Carruthers. Motion. Councillor Geddes. Councillor Groom. Motion. Councillor Maitland. Abstain. Councillor McCautry. Amendment. Councillor McComb. Motion. Councillor McKee. Amendment. Councillor Thompson. Amendment. And Councillor Witts. Amendment. Point of order, Chair. Um, I wasn't in at the start of the uh, debate on this. Um, can I just get clarification that it would be appropriate to, to vote? Thank you, Councillor Dick. Um, this is an application that was um, deferred um, from the committee in October. Now, only the members who were present at the October meeting and heard um, the original application 
um, are entitled to vote and determine this application. <coughs> you weren't present at that meeting, therefore you're not entitled to Thank determine you. it. Thank you. The application um, with five votes to six to the amendment, it will be refused on the grounds um, of the poor level of amenity and the removal of the area of open space originally identified within Planning Commission 99 oblique P oblique 3 oblique 0067. Thank you. We'll now go on to item six in the agenda, the erection of circa 350-bed hospital staff residence is Ed, uh, energy Centre and Associated Development. Approval of matters specified in conditions 3.8914, 2023 of planning permission in principle 13 stroke P stroke 3 stroke 0030 relating to the layout, design, the external appearance, landscape and phase and transport infrastructure, travel plan, traffic management, environmental management, energy centre, external lighting and seagull prevention at land at Garrick Farm, Garrick Loan in Cargan Bridge. The plan number 14 stroke P stroke 3 stroke 0478. We'll be speaking on this one. Right, back. Thank you, Chair. Uh, a minor correction to the report, um, as kindly pointed out by Councillor Witt this morning to me. Um, at paragraph 1.3 on page 42, on the fifth line, it should read bound to south and southwest, not bound to south and southeast. A site visit was held earlier this morning and all members and interested parties were invited to attend the site visit. And so some of the following images were provided as a handout and will therefore be familiar to, to the members that attended. This is the location plan showing the application site some four kilometers southwest of Dumfries. And the site is immediately adjacent to the Cargan Bridge, Cargan Bridge Industrial Estate. The reference design was approved as part of a planning permission in principle in April 2013, which was subject to legal agreement and various conditions. This reference design was created by the NHS to set appropriate design standards and to meet critical clinical adjacencies, i.e. how close one department is to another department to the theatre. That planning permission required the detailed design to be substantively in accordance with the reference design. And it's recommended that the current proposal accords with that design. Explore that at the presentation. The planning permission in principle has been approved, and so the current application is for the approval of conditions only. The report before members is structured on that basis with a list of all the relevant conditions contained in the annex. This was a, an aerial view of the reference design from the Planning Commission in principle. This plan shows um, a number of road infrastructure improvements that were secured as part of the original Planning Commission in principle. Um, it identifies junction improvements at Pleasance Avenue and New Abbey Road, junction improvements at the junction at Park Road and Dale Beatty Road, it identifies an extension of the Park Road cycleway. It provides for a bus service that is equal to or better than the existing bus service to the Bank End site. And as part of the current application, we're also considering improvements to the A75 junctions as identified. Moving through some of the photographs of the site, on this one we've got Kilnford Barnes to the far right. This is from Sir Garrick Loaning, looking towards the site, with Garrick Farmhouse to the far left of the photograph. This is from the A75, just beyond the Castle Douglas round, Road roundabout, looking to the site and beyond. 
This is the new primary access to the site that has been created. I'm panning right, looking across the site and the realigned Glen Road. This is on the Glen Road, just outside of Kilnford Barnes, and looking across the site. The new access for emergency uh, vehicles will be taken from a point approximately halfway across the, the image here. And standing at the new access site, visibility looking to the east, looking to the west and this is the new service access that is taken from uh, the uh, Cargon Bridge Industrial Estate um, and was constructed recently. This is a view from the high central part of the site looking back towards the access and you can see Garrett Farmhouse just to the right hand side of the screen. For members that are, are looking over this side, the, 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 the images have appeared back on the other screen again. Panning round to the right to the high central part of the site again and looking towards the service access, the energy centre and the residency. And panning around again to the high central part of the site, looking down towards the, the, the main entrance. I'm sorry, that is standing at the main entrance. The existing site plan shows the topography of the site and shows the hillock that is located to, to the, the, the northerly part of the site. And this is the proposed site plan. The key elements of this site plan are the Garrick Road roundabout, which has been completed, and that is shown just off the bottom of the screen. The new site entrance from there will offer two clear options into the site, leading either to the main entrance to the left, or to A and E to the right. The hospital building is central on the site with land levels rising up from the site entrance towards the hospital building and then dropping a level beyond that, enabling the height of the building to be visually minimized. Car parking comprising 980 spaces is provided to the site frontage and with large, se large sections of it being terraced again to screen the car parking area. The helipad and A and E access can be seen to the right hand part of the site. The service access is located to the far left. The energy centre is located and the service yard are located to the left of the main hospital block. And the staff residences are located to the very rear of the site at the top left hand side of the screen having been relocated during the processing of this application from the front of the site adjacent to the access. The key elements of the hospital building, again, broadly accord with the reference design. The technical block is the large central section, um, and that will contain the assessment units, the theatres, imaging, and the main entrances. The main entrance to the left leads through a reception to the dining room at the back, which will have views and access onto the landscape grounds beyond. The main entrance to the women and children's block is within the same area. And this curved building to the bottom of the page is separate from, but linked to the main hospital building. The entrance to A&E is on the far right hand side. Of the, building. the low ground Floor plan shows how the, the building is set into the landscape with the ward pavilions um, being uh, and the service yard being a ground level low below the main floor. First floor plan. Second floor plan with some minor accommodation to the left hand side. Third floor plan and roof plans that show um, farms and machinery. These elevations show the entire building, and there'll be further images uh, later that show in closer detail sections of the, the, the elevations. Um, 
the top elevation here is the principal elevation that you would see on approach to the hospital with the women and children's block uh, being a two-story block located centrally with the pitched roof form of the technical block set behind that and the main entrance defined by the tall orientation tower to the left-hand side uh, and the glass atrium. The bottom elevation is the rear elevation and that shows the, the ward pavilions, the three ward pavilions being set at a lower level than the rest. The top elevation here is the elevation that would be seen from Cargan Bridge Industrial Estate if it wasn't blocked by trees. And the lower elevation is uh, the view that would be seen from Tree House and the fields around and beyond. This is uh, taking a closer look at some of the elevations on the technical block. And uh, this is a single elevation. Um, so the top right hand part of the image joins up to the bottom left hand. Okay. And this is the rear of the technical block. Again, the top joins with the bottom. The technical block will be treated in reconstituted stone, um, which will have vertically incised systems that are um, inspired by woodland. The color is to be a Glasgow blonde with bronze powder-coated windows and a standing sea and zinc roof. This is the women and children's block elevations. And again, reconstituted reconstituted stone panels are to be used here, this time formed in a flowing linen fold, and the color is to be Galloway, Galloway white, which is lighter than the, the technical block itself. The roof on this would be flat and would be covered in teedom. Um, the, the windows would be bronze again with the, the spandrel panels um, lined to reflect the, the linen fold. These are closer views of the ward pavilions. And the external treatment of the, the ward pavilions would again be reconstituted stone, uh, again of lighter color than the technical block, um, but with uh, vertical incised patterns again that are more clustered and elongated than on the uh, technical block. These are the staff residences that are to be located to the rear of the site. And these are just to be finished in uh, a plain rough cast render with artificial slate roof. Uh, the energy center is um, a, a, a functional building and will be finished functionally. Um, the flue is uh, shown at its maximum height, but it is anticipated from the more recent calculations that have been carried out that that flue will reduce in height. Similarly, for the standby generator, the flue height is expected to reduce. The proposed site sections show the, the building and how it is set into the landscape. So on the top section, um, the, the Garrick roundabout and the site entrance is to the left with the land rising up with um, the proposed uh, woodland and parkland uh, uh, shown there with the building then setting into the landscape with the taller elements uh, uh, at the lower ground level. This is an interesting drawing that shows the, con the proposed contours of the site. And you can see how uh, the car park to the right-hand side is to be terraced in, um, how the helipad to the right-hand side is um, on a raised mound. And above that, you can see that uh, there will be a uh, overall an interesting uh, landscape setting for the hospital itself. This is the landscape master plan. The landscaping of the site involves the felling of all the trees and hedges within the site, but the retention of trees and hedges on the boundary of the site. There are four key landscape zones. There'll be ornamental landscaping um, for the formal gardens that are adjacent to the building and to the public courtyards. 
low level maintenance ornamental planting will be provided within the light well. Around the boundaries of the site, uh, there will be woodland planting, which is proposed to blend the site with the surrounding field. And there will be parkland areas, or what are described as parkland areas, as a transition between the ornamental areas near the building and the woodland area. Zooming in closer, this is the main entrance plaza. This is the dining terrace in Parkland. So there will be public access from the dining area out into this park. These are the hospital gardens that are um, uh, adjacent to the dining areas and close to the hospital uh, waiting areas. The the left-hand side garden is intended to be a general public access um, for people waiting and uh, using the dining rooms. The right garden also contains the spiritual center and is intended to be more, spirit more, more reflective. These are the ward gardens between the ward pavilions and these are designed to be accessed um, by uh, patients in the ward. And this is the women and children's garden, uh, which is a safe enclosed space for uh, uh, service users and for young children. And you can see from the, 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 the courtyard sections that uh, most of these are, are, are fairly substantial spaces in their own right with plenty of natural light coming in. A number of landscaping materials Proposed in terms of surfacing and street furniture and planting and so on, uh, uh, and all of these are uh, chosen to reflect the different landscape areas and themes. This is a photo montage that's been created from the Garrett ground about looking um, to the hospital site, and uh, trees are shown at completion here, so they will grow um, higher than. This is the photo montage from the front of Garrett Farmhouse. And you can see that that is um, largely unaltered with the exception of some tree trunks. And the photo montage from the south, from the old military road and from West Hill, um, shows that the buildings will be largely hidden and some houses. A uh, parking strategy has been submitted with the application, and uh, you can see in blue there that that is identifying visitor parking closer to the hospital with staff car parking to be um, more distant to ensure a better turnover and uh, uh, more readily available spaces for visitors to see. Um, there will be a barrier uh, adjacent to the Garrick Warehouse on the left-hand side of the site to prevent general access to the hospital site from the service access. Again, another interesting looking plan that shows that the light spillage from the site and uh, uh, identifies the uh, lighting columns across the site and demonstrates that lighting will largely be contained within the site. This is the one in thousand year flood extent um, that, that shows that even in the most severe um, flood circumstances, the hospital will um, be higher than any flood waters. And just to the top left of the top ward pavilion, you can see a, a, a streak of blue that runs along the along the site boundary and that will be a compensatory storage area to allow for any flood waters uh, uh, in the event of uh, a drastic event such as one in thousand with a hundred percent hit. Some photo montages have been provided um, or artist impressions and this is showing the main entrance to the site. This is the emergency walk-in entrance. 
internal waiting area, and this is um, the, the waiting area with the courtyard garden, public courtyard garden to the left hand side. And this is the entrance. Uh, the, there is also a, a fly through that has been provided by the applicant that gives uh, a good uh, indication of what the building looks like in, in three dimensions. And that, thank you, David, and that, that there are a, a, a number of internal shots in this, but it is useful in helping to understand how the building works in three dimensions. The main approach to the site. This is entering into the main entrance uh, reception atrium with the light well to the right hand side. And in the distance, you can see the ward pavilion. Um, through the glass, moving up the dining area with the landscaped area beyond. And this is turning around and moving towards the waiting areas with the courtyard gardens on the left hand side again. view of one of the courtyard gardens. Through the courtyard garden there you can see the spiritual center. And then the fly through takes, takes us through to one of the ward pavilions. So this is within one of the wards itself. And one of the rooms. Okay. Um, a scale model has also been provided, and that's uh, currently sited uh, within the members' lounge. And again, that's useful in understanding how the building relates to the site. In summary, planning permission in principle has already been improved on this site and the application before members now is for the approval of conditions only. The report sets out these conditions in detail and assesses each one in turn. In summary, the layout, design and external appearance of the hospital building offer an exciting contemporary building that reference, references local vernacular. 
The landscaping proposals integrate the wider landscape context to provide a positive healing environment for the hospital. A financial contribution has been secured to provide improvements to the trunk road network around Dumfries. The travel plan and parking strategy would ensure that transport to the site is undertaken in a sustainable manner. The construction works and phasing, which would take place over a considerable period of time, have been planned to minim minimize the disruption with ongoing consultation proposed to keep local residents informed of progress and to seek feedback. Furthermore, the development will be carried out in full accordance with a number of ecological mitigation plans. Finally, there are no objections that have been received from any of the key agencies. Overall, the proposal represents a hugely beneficial development for the people of Dumfries and Galloway and would at the same time support sustainable economic regeneration across Dumfries and the wide, wider region. Chair, the proposal is recommended for approval. We've got the member's questions, Gillian. Thank you, Chair. Just a procedural matter, um, to pick up on a point uh, the planner uh, made, there was a site visit this morning, and those members who perhaps were not able to attend the site visit are entitled to determine the application today. Thank you. Members, questions for Pat? Stephen. Yeah, it was just um, from the, the drawings that were shown from the site visit this morning, but um, is there any more detail on the type of screening between the the farmhouse and the boundary to the car parking? Because from the drawings, it looks like there's overflow car parking directly adjacent to the, the farm building. Thank you. This chair, this, um, this image shows uh, the parking layout. And uh, the parking is to be landscaped. Uh, the Landscaping master plan also shows um, landscaping proposals um, within the car park, uh, but the outer uh, line of car parking um, is, th there's, there's no landscaping proposed separating that outer line of car parking and the Garrick warehouse. Um, within the report itself, uh, comment is made that the, the car park is some 32 meters, I think it is, distant from Garrick Farmhouse itself, although the distance to the boundaries are, are closer. And the levels are such that the car parking uh, would be um, approximately a meter lower than the adjacent ground level. So there, there, there is uh, um, an element of separation. Um, the architect did confirm on site as well this morning that uh, they would provide some shrub planting um, along that area there, um, but that's certainly not shown on the landscape master plan. Tim McClung. Thanks, Chair. McClung. Going back to the proposed junction improvement, I noted that there is an improvement at the Pleasance Avenue New Abbey Road junction. Is there also an improvement proposed for the triangular intersection between Park Road and Cargan Bridge Road? Sorry, Councillor, which road between Park Road and Cargan Bridge Road? Yes, yes, the the indicative proposals on that. Um, the final details have yet to, to be uh, worked up and clarified, but the indicative proposals are for that junction to be reprioritized so that instead of driving out of town, having to turn around and look over your shoulder, it will, be, it will uh, drive straight through with a T-junction turning around to meet that point. That's the answer I was looking for. Thank you. Councillor Geddes. Thanks very much indeed, Chair. Uh, are we satisfied, sir, uh, or is Mr Hanna satisfied as they can be at this stage that, you know, with the implementation of the relevant traffic management plans, traffic plans, traffic strategies, etc., that we will not have a replication of the shambolic situation which pertains in the vicinity of DGRI. Uh, I think it's mentioned in the report. Interestingly enough, Chair, 
I, I noted that Police Scotland are setting out their stall uh, right at the beginning, uh, as I say, and I think it would be an absolute disaster if, in fact, what we finish up with here is in any way, shape, or form, uh, some, you know, anything like, as I say, the, the, the totally unacceptable situation. So can we have that response if that's an acceptable position? hope so. Bye. Thanks, Chair. Um, certainly, the, the information we have before us at the moment indicates that uh, every effort is being made to try and ensure that, that uh, parking management at the site and traffic management at the site is, is, uh, is appropriately managed. Um, there is a detailed parking strategy um, that sets out uh, a, a, a program of assessment of the issues arising at Bank End Road. Um, and that will be carried out um, shortly before the commissioning of the new hospital, um, should it be approved. And that will then inform exactly how many car parking spaces are allocated for visitor parking close to the hospital, with staff parking being uh, located around the periphery of the site. And there will be four types of uh, uh, parking zone, if you like, um, to ensure that there is a managed strategy of the site. So certainly it would appear at this point in time that we have as much assurance as we can that it will, um, will work successfully. Well, sir, I'm going to come back in. Uh, yeah, yes, uh, I'm grateful, Chair, for the response. It's the old cliche, of course, time is always will tell. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Oh, I still wait. Thanks, Chair. It's obvious that the site is in cl close proximity to the industrial complex of deportation plants and other works. Uh, I take it that you're satisfied that uh, the appropriate measures have been taken to date in terms of what happens to the uh, fire control zone. Thanks, Chair. Um, that, that aspect of the proposal was, um, was uh, discussed in detail and explored in detail as part of the planning commission in principle. Um, there is a, a health and safety exclusion zone around DuPont itself, which, which extends partially into the southern corner of the site. Um, however, uh, it's acceptable to have residences, car parking, sponsors, and so on within that. The hospital itself is outward, excuse me, the consultation zone um, for the health and safety executive. So that that aspect has been fully explored at the planning commission. Thank you. Alistair. I wasn't wishing to be alarmist. I just wanted to have a good say to you. Just wanted to thank you. Thank you. Could I could I just ask what's the seagull management plan go to depart? Seagull management plan. Thanks, Chair. Um, I'll have to look this one up again for one moment. On page 68, um, 4.60 um, uh, summary there that says that the Seagull prevention statement has been submitted um, and that it will be managed through a number of deter deterrents, namely sh shallow window reveals, motion deterrents on any green roofs, rainwater down pipe outlet to be fitted with leaf protection, and an adoption of a food waste strategy um, to ensure that uh, seagulls aren't attracted to the site in the first instance. I hope it works because there's another resident uh, Cargan Bridge has bothered me for <coughs> seagulls there. Lynn, Councillor Maitland. Thank you. I, I was wanting really to know what a motion deterrent would be. I mean, I would have thought a sedum roof would be a really cosy place for a seagull to, to go. So, I mean, what happens if a, a motion deterrent doesn't work? It stops working. Um, and that's one question. And the other question, actually, is, is about the use of parking discs. Is this going to be regulated? I mean, you can have parking discs so you're black in the face, but unless there's some sort of sanction, that won't work. Okay, thanks, thanks, Chair. Um, in, in respect of parking, it would have to be managed by the hospital themselves. That the, the NHS would have to manage the parking strategy on the site in the same way as manages uh, parking on its own. Um, 
and all the provisions are in place for that to, to work successfully. And certainly that has been proposed um, as part of this application. In terms of the motion deterrence on student groups, I'll be quite honest with you, I, I, I wouldn't know exactly what they comprise. Um, and, but clearly, with seed and rooms, there would be a need to ensure that uh, some girls weren't attracted. Councillor McCockery. Uh, th thanks, Chairman. Just a couple of points. Um, well, the member consultation on the travel plan, uh, that's one point. I think that uh, there maybe should be, because a wee bit of local knowledge uh, wouldn't go wrong. And could you indicate where the bus stop is within the hospital grounds? Because I think, I think that's important. Oh, obviously, Swiss Trans will be involved in this. And uh, it's not just a half hour service or 20 minute service for the town. It's buses speeding in from elsewhere, so I take it there is an internal stop near the main entrance, isn't it? Thank you. Yes, the, the, the bus stop is right next to the main entrance and the women and children's uh, block entrance. And I'll just move on to another screen. which shows the, 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 the bus lay-by. Um, just there next to the, the main entrance. Um, in respect to the travel plan, that, uh, uh, that in strict terms, is a, is, is a delegated matter now following the grant of the Planning Commission in principle. Um, the, the travel plan isn't... A, a fully suspensive condition, but um, uh, given the good relationships that have developed um, professionally between the NHS and the current and the community working partnership that we have together, I'm sure that uh, uh, the applicants would would be willing to um, engage with members on that. But they may they they may be able to confirm that themselves. Is that you, Tom, or you want them back in? No, we'll put, put, put Pat said I'll maybe raise it with the uh, the uh, applicant. So I, th I think she's maybe come to the area committee. Thanks, Dick. Thanks, Thanks. I appreciate the, the type of the roofing type. But, uh, is there any intention to, to use carbon saving or energy saving uh, facilities such as photovoltaics? Uh, my understanding is that this is intended to be. Uh, very high sustainability building. The applicants will be able to give you more details about the precise measures that are, are proposed, I think. Um, but uh, uh, yes, it is undergoing a BREAM assessment, um, and my understanding is that the application that will be made will be uh, for uh, excellence. First time speaker, Andy. Um, thanks very much, Chair. Um, just, just a couple of things. W one is the effect of seagulls, and, um, uh, and I'm particularly worried about the helipad uh, with birds uh, being scared if we do get there. So um, probably more a question that for, for the applicant when it's their turn. But the other bit is getting back to the parking situation. And um, did, did you ever consider a condition where we actually have a very robust parking situation here where you actually take it out of the applicant's hands and actually decide. So um, and, uh, my, my rationale for this is if you actually go up to the, the, the current DGRI at, at 8 o'clock in the morning and you can't get into the public car parking closest to the hospital because it's filled with, with, with cars, people who are already in the building. Right now, um, with the best will in the world, how are we going to police or how are they going to police to make sure their staff are actually not using the places closest to the to allow you, because and I think it was Councillor Geddes actually talked about the, the situation in the road outside the current DGRI. We don't have the space there. That, that just can't happen. So are we absolutely certain we've got enough car, car parking space here to meet needs at, at peak time? And I, I appreciate that fine balance between peak time and the rest of the time and not over provide. But I think we need to be very, very aware 
that uh, the A75 is not the same as Bank End Road when it comes to cars parking just uh, willy nilly all over the place. Um, so, can we get some sort of um, uh, comments on you know, if, if that was uh, taken into consideration? In terms of the parking strategy, it would need to be managed, um, or certainly it's proposed to be managed by by, by the NHS. And uh, certainly it's not within our remit, our planners, to require an enforcement strategy over and beyond that. Um, uh, as a planning authority, we, we, we've, we've asked for a parking strategy to be provided that has been provided, it uh, indicates that every effort is being made to ensure that all these issues will be resolved. Um, but as a, a planning authority in issuing a planning permission, um, we wouldn't ourselves be able to uh, enforce parking on the site. Thanks, Dr. Thompson. <coughs> Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, it was a couple of questions. It's one related to the traffic management plan. I notice um, that there is some works to be carried out on existing sort of road layouts um, at Park Park Road, etc. The one that isn't mentioned though is the one where you've got stop signs at the bottom of Rochel Road, Park Road, and the turn off there. So I, I appreciate there's talk of a roundabout at the bottom of uh, Pleasance Avenue, but I'm sort of looking for any likely sort of weakest links, if you like. So it's maybe firstly, if, if you could maybe address that. One. That that particular junction was looked at as part of the planning permission in principle, um, which is when all of the, the, the junctions and the routes to the hospital were, were assessed. And uh, it, it's actually a very difficult junction to do anything with, um, particularly with the shop being located where it is. Um, and it was concluded that, it, that there wasn't uh, uh, a necessity to change that, that particular junction because of uh, some of the complexities that arise from that, uh, the, the, the constraints that arise from, from uh, various uh, uses around that junction. Stephen, back in. Yeah, uh, th thanks for that. Um, Pat. And the second part was really to do with the uh, accessibility, both on accessing the site and within the site itself. Uh, I noticed there's quite a lot of reference made um, to do with cycle route access, etc. But I'm just thinking um, of, uh, it speaks of pedestrians as well, but is there a sort of reassurance or, or an intention to make sure that the accessibility throughout the site and access to the site would, would be provided for those using uh, mobility scooters with appropriate drop carriage and that that kind of accessibility throughout. Again, um, it is intended that uh, that the site will be fully accessible. Um, we do have very detailed drawings. The drawings that I've shown you are, are, are really just overview drawings. We do have very detailed specification drawings um, showing uh, curb layouts and so on um, and uh, drop curbs across the whole of the site and that has been looked by our road block engineers um, and uh, no objections. Councillor Maitland. Uh, <coughs> it, it, it's on that matter again, actually. I, I'm just sort of thinking about a user, um, and I, I'm not absolutely certain whether or not the parking has been laid out um, and whether we are involved in the actual layout of, of disabled parking and non disabled parking. If you see what I mean, I, I, I'm assuming we are. Um, <coughs> I mean, I'm imagining a, an 83-year-old wife, because we're all getting older, um, pushing her 85-year-old husband um, into that hospital. Um, now, it, whereabouts, uh, if you can show me the, the disabled parking in the entrance, I mean, how far and what level would she be obliged to push somebody up? Because it's on a, on a, on a slope. The visit, visitor parking is shown in blue, and uh, on the right-hand side of the screen, um, that it's difficult to read there, but the, the blue also includes disabled parking at that point there. So 
so that area, blue badge holders and patients and then on the other side, disabled parking is shown um, in front of the visitor parking. It will be uh, a level journey from, uh, from that disabled parking uh, around the teardrop shaped main plaza to the main entrances. Thank you, Chairman. That's extremely helpful. And just as an aside, um, I'm quite interested by. Um, Patrick referring to the vernacular, just exactly how does a Glasgow blonde connect to the vernacular in Dumfries and Galloway? No members question? Fine. Fine, thanks Pat. Yeah. Now go to the, uh, the objectors to David Fallis. I think David's speaking on behalf of Mr. J. Hagen and Mr. M. O. Hagen. So you've got, you've got 10 minutes, 10 minutes, David, and I'll let you know with five minutes, uh, no, five minutes, 30 seconds to go. <laughs> uh, bought, oh, sorry, bought the ticket, no buying now. Uh, thank you on behalf of my clients for the opportunity to address and put their concerns to you today. We're making a request of you as a reasonable, considerable pe people with a record of seeking to mitigate the impact of new development upon established property. To consider and appreciate the situation from my client's point of view. How would you feel if you were in their position? One day, your property has an open, unrestricted aspect across farmland. Then, in a matter of months, you're subjected to a development of the, the large scale and form that is before you today. That will be operational 24-7. And the view from their garden is going to be across acres of car parking. Illuminated car parking at one. And there is no provision at all within the drawings to ameliorate uh, the undisputed impact this development is going to have on their property. My clients have been all too aware from the outset of this project that whatever they said, the development was always going to go ahead. They have challenged each of the applications as a way to raise the nature of their concerns and seek some cooperation from the health board to respect their situation and try to mitigate the likely impact uh, the board's development is going to have upon their property and business. Despite assurances to that effect by representatives of the board at previous meetings of this committee, the scheme before you today has clearly paid little regard for my clients as it offers no mitigation to them at all. Whilst there may have been meetings, and I trust that the applicants have paid careful attention to what has been requested, it's quite clear that their actions in the scheme before you uh, and the shows the extent of disregard that they've paid to the reasonable requests that have been made to them by my clients. To present this scheme with no measures whatsoever to help mitigate the impact of the above development upon my client's premises is a true measure of the regard the board has had of the impact this development will have upon the adjoining parties. Despite promises provided to this committee at the in principle stage, where Mr. O'Keefe made a clear and specific promise to work with my clients to implement a landscaping scheme that would work for all parties concerned, it's quite clear here that despite those assurances to the committee, the only scheme that has been pursued here is the one that works only for the health board. As the way these things work, and it has happened at the last, uh, at the in principle meeting, the applicants in their address are likely to refute all the claims that I've made here and defend their position and explain why they have, and how and where they've engaged with the party to try to find amicable solutions where possible. In mentioning this, I am probably stating the obvious, but I mention it because it is still within this co committee's privilege to mediate here as necessary. As reasonable people, you must be able to appreciate the scale of the impact this development will have upon my clients, uh, home and business premises. I have, as I have already said, where presently there are fields, there will shortly be acres of car parking associated with lighting, 
huge building and a 24-hour-a-day operation. Indeed, I know you to be capable of such considerations because this is the same committee that only last month refused an agricultural building because it might adversely affect a neighbouring residential property, despite the fact that residential property was not a protected building. That residential building itself was positioned within its own farm setting. It was adjacent to larger buildings than was proposed at that time that housed cattle. Uh, and those buildings were larger than the one that was being proposed and subsequently refused. That decision made it very clear as to the standards this committee expects and the regard new development should have towards the existing amenities of established properties. In the interest of consistency of approach and co continued application of your own standards, I make the request to you on behalf of my clients that you intervene here in this matter and secure the implementation of measures to provide appropriate mitigation for my client's property from the construction of the new hospital. Within the report, and as mentioned today, it's, it said that my client's property is next to an industrial estate. That's not challenged here. But the fact it's next to an industrial estate doesn't mean to say it should be disregarded. Because you could see from the slides today and for the members that were on site, the relation, relationship between the farmhouse, my client's property, and the industrial estate is protected by an extensive belt of landscape and screening between these two uses, and it effectively screens one from the other. When the industrial estate was formed and laid out, the planners at that time recognised the likely impact that industrial use could potentially have at Garrick Farmhouse and made provision for specific measures to try and mitigate that impact. All that is being sought now and here today is that those same principles that saw the planners then seek to protect established properties from the new developments are carried through to the present day. Over time, the industrial, over the time since that industrial state was laid out, there has been growing expectation from the planning system that the rights and amenities of established land uses be respected and proposals take into account in, the, in their form and layout that's adjacent to them, so it's not unreasonable to anticipate that a similar respect and courtesy would be extended to my clients as a result of the accepted impact this development will have on their property. The mounding and landscaping that is minimum that would be required uh, would be over an identified way leave area. Um, which it can be noted, okay, it's a way leave area, but it can be noted that that has not stopped the applicant forming roads, accesses, parking areas, some landscaping over the way leave. Indeed, when the residences blocks were shown in the original sighting, they too had landscaping detailed within the way leave area. Given that the line of the pipe is central to that mark zone, there is still room for some mounding and planting to be provided. The general convention with railways is there should be no buildings or structures over them for ease of access for the repair or replacement of the facilities there under. If it is possible that roadways and accesses uh, can be put over the, ra the way leave to be sacri sacrificed if there are repairs, then the same can be said for a bit of mounding and some appropriate landscaping. In the report, it is stated that the parking areas are a metre below my client's property. However, whilst that may be the case for one area towards the northern part where the residences were first shown, it is not the case across the whole of the communal boundary. That car parking area is level with the ground, and indeed, in some instances, up to a metre above. When you consider the, the level of the parking, you've then taken into account the headlights of the cars, etc. You've then got a major disturbance to the property, where presently there is no screening at all, as was observed this morning. Since the roundabout, works have also been... Sorry, excuse me. Since the roundabout works, there have been instances where obstructions uh, of the access to my client's business has, been, uh, has, has occurred and has prevented vehicles turning into the site, causing vehicles to back up to the roundabout. 
It's fear that once the site is fully, fully operational, the instances of such conflict will become more frequent and potentially more severe to the extent it is likely to prejudice road safety. We submitted at the representations and it is maintained here today that an appropriate and simple solution to this would be to promote the provision of a yellow hatch bulk across the access as part of the various accommodation works that are being required across the wider road network for the Dumfries area. Um, the revisions that my client seeks could be appended as advisory directives, as is pointed out in the report, as is being done elsewhere. What my clients are seeking from the committee today is no favour. 30 just, seconds, David. I'm just perfect in that case. What my clients are seeking from the committee today is no favours or special treatment. What they would like is that you hold the health board to the promise its, representat its representatives made to you some 18 months ago at the time of the in-principle application. When Mr O'Keefe said they were respectful of Gareth Farmhouse and keen to encourage, sorry, to engage with the adjoining parties to overcome their concerns and achieve something that works for all parties. Sum up, David, that's the time. That's it, all parties concerned. Those are his words and promise to you, and we seek your support to ensure the health board are kept to them. Thank you. Members, any questions for Mr. Fuck? Just if we could get the, the actual uh, plans up on that, and just so we could point and see exactly what Mr. Fowles is talking about in regards to the park and being in the boat, yellow box and that. Please. It was not just find the best plan. <clears throat> the access to the business premises is off the bottom of the map. At the bottom, in the centre, there's some landscaping, there's a showing of the way leave. Way leave. The, Access extends down and joins on to Gareth Loaning. And it's proposed that on the business side of the access, a yellow box be provided. Similar to the yellow box that's provided to protect the through flow of vehicles in and up the glen, as was considered previous. Um, Gareth Farmhouse, for those maybe not familiar with it, um, at the bottom centre, there are two uh, little, bo little boxes indicating planting scheme and disabled parking and things like that. Garrick Farmhouse is underneath those little boxes. To get an appreciation of, get the, of Garrick Farmhouse itself and the extent of the landscaping that screens it from the industrial estate, if you can go back, uh, please, Mr. Hannah, to the second photo. There you are. Center of the photograph itself. Center left, you can see the extent of some of the uh, the screen bonding between the farmhouse and the industrial estate, which is off shot. That shot also clearly shows that round the perimeter and the boundary of the property, there's no screen planting whatsoever. The report makes reference to the car parking being 34 metres from the dwelling house, which is correct, but the car parking is within three or four metres of the garden ground, where the client's kids will, would like to play, etc. And between them and the, the sea of car parking, there is nothing but a post and wire fence. There's a small area which rises up to the boundary there uh, and increases beyond, because as we were saying before, the level, uh, as was asked earlier with regards to disabled parking, the level of that to the front reception for people to get back and forward. That's through the car parking area that's going to be adjacent to Garrick Farmhouse. 
and it was pointed out at that time, that is going to be leveled to the floor area um, for the hospital itself. And the hospital itself is some two to three, no, sorry, one to two metres above the garden ground of Gareth farmhouse itself. So it will be at a higher level, and the threat and impact it's going to have is, is, is quite clear and palpable. And all that we're seeking is for the amenity of the property to be protected, as was promised right from the very outset. Let, let, let's face it, Mr. Rakeef sat here and said to you that he would happily work and he would come up with an agreed scheme and an agreed solution, and all that we've got is an area of car parking. And despite comments to that not being taken on. Enough information, David. I mean, Ian. Any other members? Did did one of those slides actually show the viewpoint from the farmhouse? Thank you. There's one uh, photo montage that shows the aspect from the front of Garrett. It shows it from you know out with the garden area itself, just at the front, looking back. Right here, David. Oh, sorry. Excuse me. And that that the farmhouse is is, is facing down. Right, down it down it. Any other questions? Right. Thank you, David. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Do we have uh, Sally Hincliffe, please? You've got five minutes, Sally. I'll let you know 30 seconds to go. Thank you. Uh, um, um, I'm speaking um, in, in, as, a, as a resident and also as um, uh, the chair of Cycling Dumfries and as a member of the uh, CTC, the Cyclist Touring Club. Um, we do not wish to object to the building, uh, remove the, the building of the new hospital and the site per se. However, we do ask the committee to recognise that by moving it to the Greenfield site at the edge of town, um, measures do need to be put in place to mitigate the likely increase of traffic and the parking implications of that as well. And we don't think that the current travel plans, as we've seen that, will, will, will do that. We'd like to see more concrete provision made in the, uh, in the plans to ensure that those who walk or cycle to the new hospital have a safe and secure journey, thus reducing dependence on the private car, which is a requirement for this development, and encouraging people to take up active travel. And we believe that there's a significant road safety issue here. And the hospital has the ambition to have between 100 and 200 members of staff cycling or walking to work, which is a not unreasonable goal, uh, given the Scottish Government's target of 10% of journeys to be by bike by 2020. And this will actually be essential if the current parking provision is not to be overwhelmed by staff car parking. There are two main routes to the hospital that those on bike are likely to take. The Maxwell Town Park, for those living in Lockside, Maxwell Town and Heath Hall, and through Trachea, for those living in Georgetown and Trachea. A cycle route is only as good as its weakest link, which is usually where people have to cross a busy road. Um, and we note that in the planning report itself, it criticizes the layout of the cycle path within the hospital grounds because it crosses the entrances to the car parks, um, which, uh, as they rightly identify, creates areas of conflict. However, when you look at the routes outside the hospital grounds, cyclists have to negotiate three major crossings, and we believe that all of these need to be dealt with for the travel plan to um, actually work. For those coming by Trachea, they'll have to cross the New Abbey Road and the Dalbiti Road coming off from Park Road. And although the crossing does mention something around Pleasance Avenue, there's nothing to deal with the Dalbiti Road. And whether you're coming from the Maxwell Town Path or Trachea, uh, you have to cross Garrick Loaning, um, which is a 60 mile an hour unlimited road with poor sight lines at the point where you would normally cross, um, just off a roundabout. It's on a major timber haulage route, so there are timber wagons. Um, and there is no plans that we've seen from the council or, um, or in the travel plan to create a safe crossing on this road 
And we think that this could lead to a very nasty accident, potentially if you're having that many people cycling or walking to the hospital, um, mixing with timber lorries. More, more seriously, and actually more likely, what will happen is the hospital staff will vote with their feet and will drive to the hospital instead, um, which will then lead to obvious problems with parking provision. Um, we feel it's important to get these measures in place before the hospital is built. We would like the committee to put conditions in place to require the, the council and the NHS to work in partnership to create safe these safe cycling and walking routes as soon so that they are in place as soon as the hospital is open, because that is the point where people start to make the decision how they're going to get to work. We've talked with Sustrans and other cycling bodies, and they believe that such safe routes can be created without causing unnecessary delay to traffic or um, at exorbitant cost. And especially, this is important to plan this now, because it is always cheaper to do these things from scratch rather than to try and retrofit them once you realize you've got problems with congestion and overspill. Uh, my understanding is that the NHS are fully on board with this and with the need for provisions to be made. However, they cannot act in isolation. And the council roads department would need to actually be the ones who actually do the crossings. Um, and uh, uh, particularly at Garrett Lonings, which is the most serious ish place to do it. And we would like to see this in writing because uh, assurances are great, but it would be nice to have this actually not get swept under the carpet if it proves to be difficult. That's it. <laughs> Thanks, Sally. Yeah, we timed that well. <laughs> Members? David? Would you be looking for a, a, a lighted crossing, traffic light, that type of crossing? And the money, the money would you look for? Um, the ideal solution for the Garrick loaning, obviously, would be to continue on the viaduct if that can be managed. Although I understand there's problems with landowners on the other side. Failing that, it would need to be a signalised crossing, yes, which would mean um, that the Garrick loaning itself would need to go down to a 40 mile an hour road. But given that it's between two roundabouts, I don't think anybody goes above 40 on that road anyway. So I don't think there should be an impact uh, for that. Ian, Lee. Thank you. It's not so much a, a question to uh, Hinchcliffe, uh, but it's something in relation to what she said. Uh, she mentioned about the 60 mile per hour speed limit on Garrick loaning. Uh, it's really a question for Pat with regard to that. Is, is there not a, con uh, a consideration to reduce that to 30? I seem to remember a consultation going, coming to us as more members some time ago. I think that should be the end of session. You got that attack game, as I'm said. You got any more? Uh, Ian Dick. Uh, sorry, can, I, can I just ask you, Sally, just in, in the, the papers themselves in 4.47, I don't know if you uh, read it, but they, they refer to uh, the travel plan, which uh, refers to on site formation of cycle paths, installation of Sheffield cycle stands, and provision for staff cycling to work. Uh, and it goes on to say it makes a number of off-site measures, including new cycle routes, tooting and crossing, improved lighting maintenance and, and, and stuff. Is that not uh, sufficient? I mean, does that not cover a lot of the points? That, uh, can you tell me just exactly what more is needed on top of what is proposed within yeah. here? So, so as I've identified, it's the three, it's the three crossings. Um, crossing the Garrick loaning is the key one. Um, and that, as far as I know, there are no plans to do anything with that. Um, and also crossing the Dalbiti Road. At the moment, you again, you have to negotiate um, cars coming off the roundabout when they're often quite distracted and also coming down the hill. Um, and uh, again, we've, it's quite difficult to find a safe gap it, to cross, especially if you're crossing with somebody who's, who's a less confident cyclist. And also crossing the New Abbey Road, um, which is also a busy and will be busier. Thank you, Chair. Um, I know where you're coming from regarding the um, traffic problems with fear, and uh, it is, does say in the report that uh, your comments that uh, if, if you're going to make a cycle, shared cycle path um, pedestrian path on the, foot, on the footpath on Pleasant Avenue, that could be problematic because uh, people will probably feel. Any alternative? Yeah. Um, well, 
I agree that shared footpaths are not ideal for cycling, um, especially in areas like Pleasant Avenue where there are a lot of people on foot. It's not so bad along the Garrick Loaning where there'd be fewer people on foot. Um, ideally, um, we'd like to see separation of all modes, so foot, cycle, and um, car, motorized traffic. Um, and that's what's been shown to be most effective. However, I've not looked in enough detail at those roads. You know, I'm not a planning engineer. I can't design a cycle track. Um, but that would be the ideal solution in, in principle. Any other questions? Sally? Thanks very much, Sally. Do we have Mr. John Room? Thanks, John. You've also five minutes, and I'll let you know if 30 seconds to go. Good morning. Uh, my name is John Rome. I'm the owner of Kilnford Farm Shop. Uh, most of you will be familiar with a, a position which is adjacent to the hospital on, on the Glen Road side. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to the committee. Uh, I want to hi highlight three points of serious concern uh, regarding the impact of the hospital development on our business. I completely understand that these points are probably trivial in the grand scale of things, but they're very important to our business. I expect most of the committee are aware that our farm shop has only been trading for three years, and we now employ over 40 people. And we've established ourselves as the number one destination in Dumfries and Galloway for the sale of local produce. It's also very popular in our area with tourists. Uh, the success of our business is in no small part due to the care we have taken in creating a unique ambience within a rural environment. And we want to preserve that at all costs. I would ask for your support on this. I'm particularly concerned about the emergency exit on the Glen Road close to our shop entrance. Unfortunately, the plan does not provide enough detail to ascertain how far this is from the exit. In fact, in many, many of the, the sketches, it's not even shown. Or, or how much of the existing hedge is supposed to be taken out. And the plan that Patrick showed, uh, I think the, the, the aerial plan, showed all of the hedge right to the, or didn't show any of the existing hedge at all. Now, uh, I would ex ask that, that the retaining as much of this hedge is, is a high priority. The easy option of pulling it out should not be allowed. This is not only in the interest of our business, but for the interest of the visual amenity of the whole community, particularly the residents of the Glen. There's, if there's a genuine will to reduce the visual impact on the locality as a consequence of the construction of these very large buildings, then the retention of the hedge must be given a high priority. And this can easily be done through the impos imposition of some appropriate condition. So uh, again, I would ask for your support on that. Now, undoubtedly, the fate of the hedge will be central in the discussions about the sight lines for the emergency exit. At present, the Glen Road, I think, is a 60-mile-an-hour trunk road, which obviously requires long sight lines. Firstly, we've had several minor incidents at the exit of the shop with drivers assuming, because they're on a blind, a blind uh, no-through no road, that there's nobody coming down from the right. In fact, the traffic does come down from the Glen at very high speed. We also have a pedestrian crossing point, which is often used by children, and it, that also is a potential hazard, and at the present requires very careful management. Added to this, in the proposed plan, there will be an emergency exit for vehicles close to our exit. So I would ask that consideration be given to reducing the speed limit around this area to enhance road safety. A lower speed limit would also r reduce the need, need for long sight lines, and allow more, more of the existing hedge to be retained and, and allow us to keep more of our privacy, privacy in rural setting. Thirdly, I would like to highlight uh, from our perspective the, 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 the problem of car parking, which has already been addressed by some others. At present, our car parking is, present, is sufficient to cope for the needs of our business but it certainly could not cope with hospital staff, outpatients, visitors parking in our car park and walking to the hospital. Plans must be, 
put in place in the development to prevent this from happening. And the developer must ensure that there are, that there's more than the bare minimum of provision to satisfy the operational needs of a new hospital. I'm particularly concerned about pedestrians walking via the accident emergency exit, and at present there is no, it doesn't look like there's anything to stop it, and accessing our premises at this at section of the road. At present there's not enough detail in the plan for me to know whether it's even been considered. 30 seconds, John. Uh, or what measures are to put in place? I would just ask that there be a specific condition that may, that, uh, attached to this that places the responsibility for this on the developers and not leaving us with the problem after it happens. This will be prejudicial in the interest of road safety as well as impacting our business. Thank you very much. Thank for you very much. In the Members, any questions? No. Jane. I wonder if, again, could we see any pictures, please? And Chairman, could we possibly look back at that? So we've seen that boundary statement now. The most relevant plan, please. How indigen? Yes, it, it, it would have been helpful probably to put the properties in you know, so that we can really clearly see them where they, where they are. Um, and, and so the hedge is going all along that, that line. No. Um, sorry, we can deal with that through... through um, I apologise, Chairman. I realise, just like Councillor Blake, we can deal with that when it comes to the... Uh, but... but what, what I understand the objector is saying is that he feels there is no barrier to stop people moving from his property onto the A&E. Is that the case? Partly the barrier, partly the view that uh, people are going to have with, from within our car park and as they exit our car park, they're going to be looking right onto an industrial site, which is completely inconsistent with what we're trying to create. And we have what we've spent quite a lot of time and effort on creating is, is going to be nullified and I'm quite sure it can be done. I don't. I think there, there is no hedge shown there. I think it's because nobody's actually really bothered about it. They, they've drawn a line around it and told the people to plan within it. And you can see there's a lot of uh, um, there, there is a, a lot a lot of landscaping shown all around. I suspect there are issues with how high that has to be with a helipad. Uh, there will be issues about sight lines. Uh, but if we don't make some uh, statement at this point of how important it is to us. The simple thing for, a, for some, a roads person or a helicopter person is to say, let's just take the whole lot out. And uh, when they come along with the digger, I, I, there's nothing I can do. So I would ask for your support in, in making sure that they don't just uh, blitz the place because we, we have created something which I hope you'll value and, and, and support us in. This saying 4.9, that the, the extension of the hedge at a proposed height of 3.5 metres offers better screening of the site and the helipad and ensures that the rural, rural car characteristic of the Glen Road is maintained. <coughs> Thank you for that clarification, Chairman. Uh, members, thanks very much, John. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have the applicant, the applicant, Jeff Ace? Right, Jeff, you've got five minutes, and I'll let you know 30 seconds to go. <clears throat> Thanks, Chairman. If I can uh, start by introducing our bid director, and then I'll finish up. 
Good morning, uh, Chair. Um, my name is Graham Lang, and I'm the Planning Director at GL Heron Property Consultants. And uh, we were agent on the planning application uh, before you. Um, I'm also joined this morning by Jeff Ace, Chief Executive of NHS Division Galloway, and also by our colleague Paul Bell of Rider Architecture, who's sitting behind me. Uh, first, I'd like to thank Pat Hanna and David Sutty for their efforts in dealing with the application and the service received from their department. Um, as the committee are aware, the principle of the proposed hospital was established in May 2013 when the council granted planning permission and principle for a new hospital on the application site. Since then, a huge amount of work has been undertaken to develop the proposals that are before you today. In addition to developing the detailed design of the hospital, since February of this year, there have been ongoing enabling works, which you saw this morning, uh, including site investigation works, clearance works, utilities works, creation of site compounds, the creation of new service road entrance, and works to the Garrick roundabout and Glen Road. Consequently, there is a significant amount of momentum behind the project. Critically, the proposed hospital stays true to the reference design, and the positioning of the technical block, the energy center, car parking, landscaping, helipad, and so on, all follow the framework established by the PPP. Whilst following the reference design, the proposals have been informed by a significant number of detailed technical assessments, including reports on landscape impact, flood risk, ecology, noise, transport, construction, and travel management. The vast suite of technical information has guided the detailed design of the hospital, ensuring that the proposals before you are fully deliverable. You'll have seen from the images shown how the new hospital will fit into the landscape. Members will also have seen how the hospital will make use of very high quality finishes, including the extensive use of reconstituted stone to ensure that the new hospital will have longevity and create a real sense of place. While the proposals take into account a huge suite of technical information, they have also been informed by discussion and consultation with the local community and various interested stakeholders, including the Community Council and the Glen Road Users Group. Our clients' proposals have been influenced by these discussions. For example, it was our clients' clear preference to have the staff residences located at the entrance to the site for a number of practical design and operational reasons. However, this proposal was met with quite strong resistance from uh, local residents and from council officers. Um, consequently, my client took the decision to relocate the residences to the southern part of the site. The recommendation to approve the application unconditionally is one that we fully endorse. And we welcome the fact that there are no statutory consultees, have got no objections to this, no objections from Transport Scotland, no objections from SEPA, SNH, Historic Scotland, Scottish Water. For an application of this size and magnitude, that's quite a feat. Approval of the application will represent another key milestone in the delivery of the project. It will also allow the project to move forward on programme with a full site start programme for the new year. I will now pass over to Jeff A, who will finish by explaining the importance of the proposals to the board and the wider community. Thanks, Chairman. This is a, a cornerstone project for us. It's a continuation of work that began in 2008 to really ensure that we can maintain local access to trauma, emergency work, elective work, and diagnostics within the region. We aim to open in 2017 the best hospital in Britain. Uh, that will be a huge aid to us in, rec in recruiting and retaining our, our key clinical staff, but it will also give the best patient experience available anywhere in the country. Uh, the momentum of this project has been me mentioned, and I would like to place on record at this point our thanks to uh, council officers for the excellent partnership working that's uh, been displayed throughout this project. It really has been a good uh, foretaste of what's to come with health and social care integration, uh, and without their, their assistance, we would not be at this point today. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Good day, as well. Thanks, Chair. Um, Jeff, could I just ask you, please, um, first of all, if, if you can uh, accommodate any of the suggestions uh, that have been made by the objectors, namely there was the yellow box one and the cycle route. Um, the second one was I asked the council officer about um, um, energy saving. I understand the type of roofing you're using. Um, are you going to use, for example, photovoltaic? And finally, um, when you introduced this to the council, um, some time ago, um, I, I 
or seminar, I think it was, I'd asked whether with the, the onset of, of social work services and, and uh, healthcare integration, there would be facilities within the new building to accommodate um, social services, so the, the process by which um, uh, patients can are, are moved back with appropriate care to, to home is accommodated, because I don't see it in 1.9 on page 43. Thanks. If I, if I can start off on some of the general points and I may uh, hand over to the experts on my left. So taking your last point first, Councillor, certainly we, we have uh, already hospital-based so hospital social workers in, in DGRI. We are expecting to continue and expand that provision. We've sourced, we've spaced off this accommodation accordingly to enable them to uh, continue what's their, their, their very valuable function. In terms of the BRIAM excellent point that, that you noted, um, we, will, we will be required to demonstrate to the Scottish Government an excellent score in terms of energy conservation. DGRI at the moment is uh, scores in, in about the lowest category um, across most of the, the ranges and we'll be, able, we'll be expected to demonstrate um, very significant improvements in energy efficiency ac across that scoring and we can do so through this design. On the points of how, we've, um, how we can ad uh, adapt to um, to object uh, issues, I'll, I'll pass over to my colleagues on the left. In terms of the, the, the matters raised by the, the interim recycling uh, route, um, I think our position is that the off-site improvement measures considered and implemented through the PPP stage um, effectively ensure that this site is accessible via choice modes of transport, including cycling. Um, the section of the road referred to the position that we don't consider that to be a significant barrier to cyclists reaching the site. Um, and then when you do get to the site, there is a clear way through the car park area, pathways that take you to the entrance where there is dedicated parking for 88 cyclists, which is also covered comfortable with the off-site measures that are in place already. Fine. Councillor Crowers. Thanks, Chairman. Uh, firstly, thanks very much for the presentation. It was, uh, nobody would deny that we're looking at something quite special here. To the least, and would, would welcome the, the whole concept coming into the piece in particular. We welcome it uh, with open arms. In regards to the points that were raised by the, uh, the, the objectives today, just so I mean, Certainly, we're clear that the statutory consultees have not objected to this, and congratulations to that as well. But the points that I've certainly picked up in regards to the first uh, represent, representation, but we just to make sure what like your thoughts on how these could be addressed. There was potentially a conflict uh, at, at, the, at the access to the to the farm, to the hold on the left, to the south west, southwest. That is, I think, isn't it? Like the southwest of the site. Uh, it was mooted that possibly a yellow box could have. A, uh, would have accommodated any real risks there. Is that an option in your view? Also, the actual the extra planting, I think, was. Uh, remember back to the original application when it came up for it in principle or outline, we did think that it would be some form of bund, earth bund at, at that screen, and which would completely separate the. That was certainly in the back of my mind when I seen this coming back up. So, I mean, is that an option? There's some light screen in there, there's some trees and some, some smaller, looks like bushes uh, in regard to. to, to more, more mitigation with that. The travel plan in regards to the cycling, I think uh, you've pretty much covered that. Uh, but there's three road crossings in particular what, what were asked for, which was the Garrick, uh, I think it was Dolbeta Road and New, New Abbey Road. Just if you comment if they, if they could be uh, added or what, what, certainly what your view is in regards to that as being conditional. And the last points where we're, what I picked up in regards to that from Mr. Rome was the retaining of the, the existing hedge. It's no it's not clear in the plan, so is the red line what you've outlined, is that within I think you it's stated within the, the actual the wording within the report that it should be retained, but just to be absolutely clear on that, uh, the parking plan should reflect that I think it is their car park shouldn't be used as an overspill. Clearly it looks like there's an access there. Is that access is that a pedestrian access into the site? near the Kilnford, or, or is it not? Is it restricted access, or have got to go right round? It certainly looks like it when you look in the plan. I think that was the main part, uh, okay. Chairman. If, if I can kick off, Councillor, quite, quite a few issues there. With, with regard um, cycling, I, I think 
you, you note, um, and, and we've made a point about the, the adequacy of provision. I, I think our ambition is to be better than adequate, and I understand that Sustrans, uh, in particular, continue to work on potential um, alternative arrangements around cycle access. We'd be very keen to continue to work with, with them to make this, uh, to make cycle access a lot better than adequate uh, into the site. The hedge issue, it is my understanding that the hedge remains. Um, so, uh, that as, is, as is stated in the, in the um, document. That, that, that's correct. The, the hedge, with the exception of the section to be removed for the, for the access, the, the hedge will be retained in its entirety. Um, there are drawings uh, that were submitted uh, to show that that access is only for vehicles as well, no pedestrian uh, access. I mean, in terms of the parking issue, I mean, my clients, it's absolutely the case that the ambition, or no, it's not an ambition, that this site has been designed to vastly improve in the situation that, that currently exists. There is, you know, my client has no interest in operating a hospital that doesn't, add, well, more than adequately provide suitable parking for, uh, for staff and visitors. Um, there are no, the way the hospital has been designed, uh, there should be no motivators for anybody to park out with the site. It would be a far less convenient arrangement uh, for people to park out with the site and then journey into the hospital. It's perhaps unlikely to exist with the, with the current facility. Thank you. Councillor McCartney. Yeah, th thanks, uh, Chairman. One or two matters have already been addressed. I, th I think I'd maybe like an assurance that uh, they'd be prepared to come to the area committee with a travel plan, because I feel that there needs to be a bit of input there. I think there's issues raised by uh, the, the cyclists. Well, one or two which are actually addressed in the report, I don't think we may picked it up. There is actually a crossing there on the uh, New Abbey Road. For some reason, they called it Priestlands Drive, but that, that, that's actually the crossing at the New Abbey Road junction with the uh, Pleasance Avenue. I don't know why they call that Priestlands Drive. It's a street further along. But I, I would like to see the, um, the, the the health board come to an area committee with the travel plan. So I think there are issues raised that we could address. I'd also like to see the council officers there as well from the roads department because it, the, there was the, the issue raised there about the junction of Tolbiti Road and uh, Park Road. Why, but what, Tom, I'm just wondering why you're wanting to the area committee. I, th I think in, t in terms of a, tra a travel plan, it affects uh, them freeze more than anywhere else. And it's only just to have a bit of input there from, uh, from members. I think that would be the appropriate forum. I don't think it's a planning issue. It's more an issue of trying to address some of the concerns. And I would, uh, if I can get an assurance from the, the health board, they're happy to come along. I think we do no harm. Yeah. Always happy to attend area committee, Chairman. Sorry, Ian. Did you walk back in? Yeah, we just, I mean, I, I suppose that everything was covered apart for the two points in particular in regards to the potential of having a yellow box to, re, to, to restrict uh, actual accidents in the screen. And I mean, I did go back to the previous application. I was quite sure we were looking at an earth bun to, to have better screen in there, but we've come back, back with some plans. So just what, what the views in particular, everything else was answered. The, the, ye the yellow box for road safety issues uh, and the, the, the extra screen. Um, Client, no objections to the, the yellow box uh, whatsoever. I'm sure that that something that can be uh, delivered. Um, in terms of the screening, um, it's certainly been a challenge to accommodate the, the, the objector. Um, there have been an ongoing dialogue between uh, Glen Road users group and the objector and the group meeting. Um, I think they had objected to the. PPP scheme, the bonding, the objections from the residents is proposed there, and now we've got objections to the, the current scheme. Um, I think the, the current scheme does try to arrive at a reasonable solution here. Um, what, what you've got, I think, is approximately 15 spaces that sit on the other side of a landscape strip to the car park, which separates the wider car parking area from the property. And ensures that you will not have a sea of car parking that the objector rests on. Um, plus, Pat had mentioned before, you have the 30 feet metre standoff. Um, the outlook to the front is open 
Um, the property doesn't have a right field view, but by removing the residence from the front, I think the image, one of the images showed earlier that the property will actually continue to have a very open aspect. Um, slide up on the screen. Um, that taken together with levels difference, I think it's our view that we have taken quite reasonable measures where possible to accommodate the owners of the farmhouse to arrive at a, a solution that gives the house a good level of amenity. Yeah, Councillor Driver. Thanks very much, Chair. I'm just um, looking at the question that was raised by an objector earlier on about all ability access from the car park and, and the table side of things. Uh, I, I would imagine that you will be working under the CDM regs, as all major uh, uh, um, projects do. Uh, there's also an issue which is existing within the DGRI, which I'm, I'm wondering about in the future with regard to future proofing of services such as O2 IT and things like that. Now, obviously, in, in DGRI, it was built so many years ago. You've got, you know, oxygen uh, lines going through the roof. And, uh, and, and that's one of the reasons, of course, why we're building, uh, hopefully building a new, a new hospital. So just the, the, the main issue about all ability um, uh, integration with, with the car park, but also future proofing for services. Uh, our ambition throughout, throughout this was to uh, avoid a DGRI situation where a, a major refurbishment effectively closes you to clinical activity, which is our, our problem at DGRI at the moment. So the hospital is being designed in a way that we can refurbish, renovate without um, uh, disrupting patient care, indeed even on a room-by-room a, a, a -room basis, the way that the um, facilities are brought in, electrical, mechanical, medical gases are brought in, they can be serviced largely without disrupting that room's availability. So the flexibility of this design is one of its, one of its big advantages. Uh, in terms of, of very long-term future proofing, obviously it, it will open on seven and a half wards, has the ability to flex up to eight wards uh, fairly quickly, and very long-term has potential ability for some, for some uh, other facilities on site as well. So we think we have a, a far more future-proof, um, flexible model than, we, than we're left with at the moment. Uh, McComb. Thank you, Chair. Just looking at the slide there, we have examples of two types of screening. One of them to the east of Garrick Farmhouse and one to the west. I know which one certainly I would prefer in terms of screening. Do you believe that open parkland provides effective screening in the case of Farmhouse. Uh, good afternoon. Um, what we have on the on the screen there, on the on the, the right hand side, the, the screen into the industrial park is obviously very mature planting. What's shown on the image uh, is the level of planting which will be available on opening of the facility. That obviously will will grow and mature uh, with time. Um, if you look at the um, site plan detail, if you can get that on, please. Is it a, is the, the wider one? Yeah, that one. So, in terms of uh, looking to mitigate uh, the impact onto Garrick Farm, what we've try to do is, is screen um, the vast majority of the parking areas uh, by a number of landscape features. Um, the central parkland, if you like, that comes through and provides a setting for women and children, gives a, an effective screening to the, the larger area of parking uh, associated uh, with emergency care center, which is on the, uh, the uh, right-hand side of that image. On the left-hand side, where the parking is associated with the main entrance, we've tried to um, contain that within a, a landscape uh, screen and strip um, with uh, tree, pl tree planting and shrub planting outside of the, 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 the darker colored area, which is the wayleave area, uh, which borders the edge of the, edge of the site. Um, 
The conditions of that way leave, uh, we still are looking into the detail of those. Um, uh, we believe that um, building that bonding onto that way leave perhaps will not be um, uh, acceptable in terms of those conditions, but we are looking to um, secure the opportunity to plant light level shrub planting uh, around that, uh, that boundary, which will provide some further screen into the, the, the single strip of, of car parking, which is outside of the, the main, main area of, of, uh, of, of mature tree planting. Back in, Jim. With respect, the problem I see is that the occupant of the farmhouse is looking for effective screening from year one, not from year nine or ten. Councillor Witt. Thanks, Chair. I um, wanted to return to the issue of car parking. You know, looking at 1.8, and it says 980 car parking spaces. I'd like to know how that equates to what we currently have at the present site. And perhaps it uh, might be useful to take in the next paragraph, 1.9, which says the remaining wards are due to be accommodated in existing federal maternity units have clearly come to the award of remaining behind. I'd like to know what these were. So questions in one. Second one might have an impact on my first question because if there are fewer people up there, then it would mean that it's hard work. Thanks, Janet. There, there are a couple of re really key points there. We, we will be retaining on the Cresswell site uh, a number of services, ophthalmology services, renal dialysis, a number of outpatient therapies that take significant um, visitor traffic at the moment. We'll be retaining those at, at uh, the Cresswell site. Nonetheless, the site at 980 spaces has a handful more than our current entirety of, of DGRI uh, spaces. We're not seeing a reduction in um, available spaces. So put those two things together and we should have quite a significant improvement in car parking. The, the second point that's um, worth bearing in mind, one of, one of our, our issues at the moment is, is peak flow of car parking, as I think has been mentioned by a councillor. One of the big drivers of, of, of peak flow is, is uh, visitor times in the hospital. Obviously the, the provision of 100% single room hospital allows us to have a completely open uh, visitor policy. We won't have uh, set visitor times. So that should uh, substantially even out the flow of traffic and avoid those very heavy peaks in afternoon and early evening that, that uh, people see currently. Thank you, Karen. Sorry, I didn't quite catch what are the words to be retained, your particular first one you said. There will be no inpatient accommodation, but there will be um, significant ambulatory care, so outpatient facilities largely around the therapies, so physiotherapy, occupational therapy, also ophthalmology. So we will be undertaking uh, things like cataract surgery at Cresswell and the, the very significant volume of ophthalmology outpatients. And finally, there'll be renal dialysis. There'll be a 16-station renal dialysis unit at Cresswell, which again generates significant uh, traffic as, as the, the dialysis is, is uh, three sessions daily, uh, six days a week. Could you get members to remember to stick to the application? Jane. Um, <clears throat> could I be absolutely clear? I think Councillor McComb kindly um, covered the issue, but um, in, in uh, um, paragraph 4.17, um, the report states that the proposal does not contain the landscaping strip shown at planning permission in principal stage between the two, that's to say the application site and the, uh, and the farmhouse. Did I understand you to say quite clearly that in fact actually you do anticipate a planting strip to be between the two, the side elevation of the Gareth farmhouse? You're talking about shrubs. There is no indication of shrubs on the, uh, on the plan there. Um, I'm satisfied about the front elevation of Garrick, actually, um, but I, I, I do um, understand exactly what is being said about the side elevation. So I wonder if you could um, possibly elaborate on what you mean. Okay, sorry, just to clarify. Uh, what I was suggesting is that we could um, 
incorporate light shrub planting to that boundary, uh, which would um, satisfy the condition, what we believe are the conditions of the whaling. Heavy tree planting or heavy shrub planting, we do not believe is, uh, would be acceptable to the whaling condition. Thank you. Uh, Marian. Thank you, Chair. I think most of my questions have been answered, but just for an observation from my point of view, I think I've been listening to the objectors. I don't think from personally they're asking for anything unfairly. Uh, I heard Mr. Ace also saying that he, he's quite willing to work with them, which I'm, I'm glad to hear. But apart from that, my questions have been really answered now. Thanks. Marian. Andy. Uh, thanks for letting let me back in, Chair. Um, I'm not sure, I think I missed an opportunity to when, when Pat was answering earlier and I'm going to take it now, it might be better actually done in, um, when you go into session. But we've heard quite a lot of evidence on the volume of traffic and where it's all going and everything else. And first I agree with the, uh, the applicant's agent that uh, uh, we've got no objections. Police Scotland are actually, um, it'd be interesting to find out uh, the difference between a concern and an objection because they are highlighting some uh, concerns about the way the traffic management is going to be done. And the question really is, um, we, we've no got any figures here with the flow of traffic on the A75, which is a material consideration for the, for the traffic management in this, uh, in this application. Um, so the question I'm going to put the, to the agent, if it's okay with you, or I'll defer in your hands um, to, when we're in session, is that, was that conversation, did that conversation take place with planning, the planning officers? Um, was it considered? And um, have we got any indication? Um, and I, I, I'm, I'm reasonably satisfied in the issue about the peak time, which is, which is quite right. But the last thing we want to see is the, the Garrick roundabout to become the wacky races. I think the agent can answer that one. Certainly to take the, the main point about the A75, we, we have undertaken traffic planning uh, around this um, right from the, uh, as part of the option appraisal for the two, the two shortlisted sites, uh, Council that, that um, demonstrated um, the, the ability of the roads to, to um, deal with the, the volumes of traffic envisaged. Um, as you say, we've engaged with both um, police and fire brigade around uh, particular issues are on, on site and, and their, their uh, levels of support or concerns are, are noted. I, I do think in terms of internal traffic management, that is very low risk for this site, given the factors that, that were addressed in the, in the previous answers about split sites, about a removal of, of peaks and flows, and about the, the sheer inconvenience of anyone deciding not to park within, within the uh, hospital car parking, the, the, the the problem with DGRI at the moment um, around car parking is not that there is not space available, it is that the road is closer than many areas of our, of our car park. This is the, the reverse of what we will see in the, in the new hospital, where the most convenient place to park will be in those, those patient car parks. Okay, Andy. Chair, Chair, thanks for letting me back in. Um, I, I think what I'm particularly concerned about, Jeff, though, is when we've got a backup of people leaving at peak times and the frustration at the roundabout trying to get onto the 75 or back onto, uh, onto the, the Dupree's bypass. I think that's where, um, was, there, was there any consideration given that, for example, um, a traffic light system there at, the, at peak times, um, some, uh, some roundabouts in the central belt and other areas in Britain? <laughs> only good, yeah. Chairman, I, um, again, I, I can only refer you Councillor, to our uh, original traffic planning work that demonstrated we would be able to um, we would be able to comfortably deal with the flows of traffic. The, the healthcare provision is is changing, as you'll be aware. We are under um, significant pressure to be cut to even our services more across the seven days of, of the week to provide more um, shifts available um, on weekends, for example, to increase our weekend service provision. This all has the effect of evening the flows of traffic away from uh, particular peak times. And by the time of this hospital opening, we will be completely in the, in the, down the road of a, of a seven day service uh, that is already being trialed. Thank you, Dr. Uh, 
Thanks, Chair. I mean, I got the answer earlier on about the services side of things from, from this new hospital, but I never got an ac uh, the, the, the all ability access to the car park with regards to the CDM. Yeah. Chair, apologies. Yes, as, as you noted in your uh, introduction, Councillor, we, we work to the Dis Disability Discrimination Act recommendations. This will be an exemplar site for that, from that purpose. Thank you, Councillor Dick. Thank you, Chair, for letting me back in. Um, that's obviously the main uh, entrance and exit to, to the site. Just take a hypothetical situation. Suppose a um, high sided lorry with straw or something came round there, blocked it off. Where are the alternate routes in and out of the site? In that circumstance, um, provision is made to take access to the services that you have access. There is a secondary access. All questions from members? Thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, it's a couple of points. Just the uh, section 2.3 just refers to the 20 mile an hour speed limits uh, in terms of uh, designing streets. And I was just wondering if that was something that um, you were going to commit to internally in terms of what you had control over with the internal traffic management. Um, the other thing was to do with the, the travel plan, which under section 4.47 Although you'll obviously have made a travel plan, I understand that you'll have made a contribution and it's really for the council to actually undertake the actual preparatory works in terms of the off-site um, cycleways and provisions such as, such as that. So I'm just wondering how much, if that's already been agreed, which it says in the paper, how much further influence can what we say to you now have in terms of that plan that is now seeming to sit with the council? Um, so I don't know if you can maybe address those points. Thanks. If I could take the last point first and then I'll, I'll pass across it. We, we're community planning partners with yourselves and it's clearly in our interest that we get to something that's mutually satisfactory. As, as, as you said, we've, we've lodged a, a significant sum of money or proposed a significant sum of money to be lodged with, with council for this work uh, and we'll, we'll very, uh, be very pleased to continue to work with you on, on that basis. Um, I'll pass, pass over on the internal speed limits. I mean, the internal speed limit is for the for the board to control, um, but they're very happy to have a 20 mile an hour uh, restriction within that car parking area. Yes. Members, thanks very much, Jeff. Tim, you can take and go back. To sleep now. Members are now in session. Crothers. Thanks, Chairman. Just, just come back to the points I raised earlier. Just how, how could we possibly get these conditioned in regards to the elevator? We know that the hedge will be uh, existing. It'll, it'll be retained because I don't. I just want to make sure it's, it's all retained there. Uh, the screening. I am still unsatisfied with the level of screening we've got. The, the picture, the view we got, faced uh, straight across and away to the right hand side, panned away to the right. When you look at the house, it looks straight at the hospital, and that's the view that we didn't actually see. So. Is a potential to put up whether it's clearly advice we're getting it a bun would be difficult. So there's a is there some kind of permanent uh, something kind of put in the immediate way in regards to some kind of barrier, whether it's acoustic barrier or or uh, that type of can you've got all different types of that's the main points. We picked in travel plans, but obviously uh, Mr. Rome's points as well in regards to the restrict I think they are pretty much covered if we can tie the condition in regards to the hedge. And the restriction of access, I think it's for emergency only. But just if you could see how we tie that into the actual uh, conditions, please, Chairman. Maybe there's quite a few more points. Maybe you can answer it. You picked stuff earlier on. Um, yes, well, I'll probably ask Pat to cover anything that I missed. But this is a very specific type of application. Obviously, the planning permission in principle has been granted. And there's also been the further application for the, the road works, which many of you will have seen this morning. At this stage, you cannot attach any owner's conditions because this is an application for approval of the matters which were specified in the conditions of the planning permission principle. So just to be clear on that, you can't now add anything, certainly which is owner's. If there's something which has directly come as a result of this, you could. But as Pat's report points out, if there are still any loose ends, the better way of tying those up 
is with uh, what are called directives, that advice that would actually come out on that. <coughs> and certainly some issues um, we would want as officers to actually attach with those just to clarify things. I think the yellow box area was actually, is actually with the application site. The, so that was considered as part of the previous application that Pat can probably confirm. Uh, the, the, the access to Garrick Farmhouse um, comes out onto the Garrick Road and, and all of these issues were looked at as part of the transport assessment, a very detailed transport assessment carried out survey, traffic level, uh, calculated predicted traffic level, negotiated with the specific development that was being proposed and looked at what mitigation measures were being considered necessary. In terms of the uh, access to, to Garrick Farmhouse, it, it wasn't considered uh, necessary at um, that point um, to, to have a, a yellow box access. Uh, it was, um, as we saw on site this morning, appropriate to have a yellow box uh, at the Glen Road um, access because it's clearly Glen Road is a uh, public road with a lot more traffic than a private. And probably the, the other issue which wasn't anticipated at the time of the planning permission principle, as you can see just on the, the bottom left corner there is the this, I think it's 12 meters wide way leave that has come up um, following that planning permission principle being granted that Scottish water requiring. Now that does unfortunately limit the extent to planting and bunding which had been originally envisaged. Um, that's perhaps not ideal, but certainly I think you've had an undertaking today that it will be investigated for whatever non-deep root plants can go in there to actually assist in providing screening. And the other point which I'd have to make is the fact that as officers, we were considerably concerned by the original scheme that came in with that whole area down at the very bottom there being a, a three-story <coughs> three flat roof box extension for the residences, which would have been right in the middle of the outlook for um, the residents of Garrick Farmhouse. And that is a fairly significant change that that was all amended and it now is up in the top left-hand corner of that slide, which will considerably improve their amenity, both visually and in terms of a reduction of disturbance. So I think you can demonstrate that we have, in partnership with the applicants, uh, improved the scheme considerably to the benefit of the the, applicant, uh, the objectors at Garrick Farmhouse. Um, ultimately, the, there is still scope for looking at some improvements, but we have to bear in mind that we leave that exists and work around that as best we can. Ian? I think on the basis of the advice you've given us, um, we'll sort of move, move the recommendations, providing these, these issues can be taken forward in the most, um, uh, in, in the best manner possible. Sorry, Councillor Blake. I think you meant the Ian without that. <laughs> uh, really, I've, I've two points. They're both uh, referring relating to speed limits. Uh, Sally Hinchcliffe met, certainly mentioned about the 60 mil per hour speed limit on garlic loaning. And it's certainly in my memory that either as a ward councillor or through the area committee, there certainly was consideration given for the, the, uh, reduce, reducing that to 30 mil per hour. I just would like to hear Pat could come back on that. And secondly, the, uh, John Roan mentioned or, or suggested a, a reduction in the speed limit on the Glen. Would that be within our powers? Surely, I would have thought that would have been with uh, the normal procedure through the roads department. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, I mean, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you, if it had been felt necessary to attach speed limit conditions for things within the application site or immediately adjacent to it, that really should have been done at the Planning Commission principal stage. It is obviously open to the Council as Roads Authority to promote any um, speed limits that it sees appropriate, but that's not within the role of this committee. Mr. Driver. Thanks, Chair. I'm sure we'd all love to go the best way forward for any planning application. The, the, the situation is that um, I think Mr. Fowler said it earlier on about would you prefer uh, to see that or, or, or that? And I think Councillor McComb backed up by saying when he saw the, the picture, I'd prefer to see the thing on the right as to the left. We all know, of course, that a view is not a planning, a planning consideration at the end of the day. Uh, and, and, and whether we like that or not, it isn't a, isn't a planning consideration. 
So the situation is, what I've heard is that um, the, the, the applicant is trying to address some of those issues with the, um, with the objectors. It may be that some of the objectors are, are, are trying to get far too much from the applicant. Um, so the situation, as far as I'm concerned, is we actually go with the recommendations within the, um, the report. Ian, very sorry. No problem. I just, if I can get an answer to the first, the first question, that was the a suggestion of a proposed speed limit reduction in Garrick Loaning. I'm, I'm sure that was considered. Maybe Councillor McCoffrey, he's got a better memory than me. He might be able to come back. We can't enforce that, Ian. No, I'm not asking it to be enforced. The, the fact is that a representative brought that, that up, it's giving the difficulty for cyclists because of the 60 mile per hour speed limit. I'm certain somewhere in the point that there is a suggestion to reduce that, and that may allay her fear. Here it comes. I want to before the other comes. Tom. Thanks, Chairman. I mean, I, I hear what's been said, and I realise there are uh, very valid uh, points that were raised by the objectors, but we can't do them within this uh, context. However, um, I think it's fair to say that over the last 18 months, there has been uh, regular meetings between the residents of the Glen and the businesses there and the, uh, the hospital board, and I'm hopeful that uh, that will continue during the building stage. And I'd like to suggest that uh, the developers, having heard the concerns raised by Mo, uh, Mr. Rome and by uh, Mr. the two Mr. O'Hagan's through David Fallis, that we can perhaps try and address these at the regular meetings, because what I've found is having these regular meetings where the, the people who actually reside in the area get the opportunity to put these points across, that was one of the prime movers, along with the planning officers, in helping to shift the, uh, the uh, proposed residences back to where they, they were in the outline uh, to begin with. So I'm kind of hopeful that uh, we've seen a bit of uh, coming and going from the health board. If these regular meetings can continue, and we can try and address uh, these issues of uh, both the screening uh, from the side of uh, Garrick Farmhouse and the retention of the hedge on the, the Glen Road. And I think that they can be uh, get given assurances at that meeting. Um, I, th I think some of the other issues, because the Health Board are prepared to come to an area committee, I think we can address a lot of the other issues uh, concerning the road speeds, the cycling issues can, can be addressed by the area committee. And th th there are needs for our uh, roads officers to come to these meetings as well. Because one of the proposals for the Obiti Road Park Road would certainly have a big impact on the residents of Janefield, and I think they would have something to say about any proposals there. So I think on that basis, I'm quite happy to go along with that. Councillor McKee. It's okay, Chair. I found out the process. Alistair Gary. Thanks, Chair. As far as I'm concerned, sir, uh, the recommendation is commendably brief and succinct. A personal driver has already moved it. As far as I'm concerned, I, I have no uh, compunctions whatsoever in seconding that. Uh, it's to the point, and it's very much in point. Jane, you want in? Uh, yes, I do. Um, I, I, I'm not quite as sanguine as members, actually. Um, there is no question about it that when this came forward to us um, for planning permission in principle, um, there was a strip of planting between um, the Gareth farmhouse Mr. Hayden's property and the uh, and the the application site. Now I understand what's being said about the way leaves, but I think I need to be have some complete clarification that there will be a directive to say, um, and I don't know whether a directive is the same as a condition. You have to have these six six things which support a condition. Whether a um, a directive can simply say that we do expect that the council does expect um, mitigating measures shallow rooted shrubs, whatever can be done. Because I understand the thing has changed since that planning commission in principle, but it was perfectly clear that that's what members expected. And, um, and I think that that's got to come through. Um, you know, this is public sector, and public sector has got to be ultra careful about using its muscle against um, individuals who uh, might suffer detriment. So um, I want to be quite clear that that directive will have a proper wording and any expectation of what we as members expect to have. David. Thank you, Chair. Yes, basically a directive is not as powerful as a condition. It's not enforceable, and therefore you can actually 
pretty much say whatever you wish in it. It's, it's really setting out advice and aspirations of the planning authority. So there's no harm, and I would certainly echo the comments. It's obviously a change in circumstance <coughs> with the way leave coming along, which wasn't uh, necessarily foreseen to be as wide as it is now required, which has removed <coughs> the possibility of the, the bund as was originally promised. But there's no problem at all about uh, putting on a, um, a directive basically stating the aspirations and desires of the committee to ensure as best as possible that there is some uh, planting and screening along that or others. Stephen? Yeah, it's just um, actually to do with the travel plan and how we take that forward uh, with appropriate consultation, et cetera. And I think this is a major application. It's a Dumfries and Galloway um, uh, project and it affects the whole of the region. And I think if we're going to, I don't think we should just limit the focus to Nithsdale area committees and what have you, because there's people going to be traveling from all over the region to get here and it's going to have a, a much wider impact, uh, whether it's by bus service or um, or even indeed by cycle. So uh, uh, I think we should maybe factor that into how we go forward in terms of taking the roads travel plan. If you'd maybe uh, assure me on that one, thanks. It is um, slightly difficult to answer that one, to be honest, because normally these conditions that come on here are operational matters which are delegated to officers. So there isn't really a, a mandate to area committees to look at planning conditions. So I, I can't give you that assurance. Uh, if it is, as we heard from um, Mr. Race, they're willing to come along and speak to area committees, that's uh, entirely voluntary. And if they want to do that, that there would certainly be no objections from us as officers to them doing that. And that can help inform it. But certainly there, there isn't a a planning function with area committees to require that. Ian. Thanks, Jim. I just to, uh, in the first instance, let's say the pres excellent presentation, everybody's polished, that's quite clear. I mean, there's, there's nobody trying to stop this in any way, and that's certainly not what will happen. I agree entirely, entirely with what uh, Councillor Maitland just said. I would echo exactly what she said. But I would like the, the, the directive to include a, a kind of the possibility of a, a permanent fence for the tick barrier. If that comes to it, the permanent fence, then that stops the route penetration. And we get something up, so it's not take ten years to be established. It can be up and established straight away if that's a possible option. Tony, Tony, chair. <coughs> these are sort of. If you look at the objections, there's two objections. We've got assurances that these will be looked at. <laughs> Some of the stuff's coming in left wing, which isn't really for us. This is a major, major development, both regionally and nationally. It's the biggest thing we've sat over, and to get to this point now with. I'm not saying it's trivial, but with small details that folk can get sorted out, I think it's testament to the way that things have been handled. And I would happily accept the recommendations and the assurances we've had from the health board and from the officers. I just move on. Members agreed? Well, as I say, I think we'll take a comfort break. Come back at the... Uh, um. Thank you, Chair. Yes, it's been confirmed that this application will be approved. Um, as detailed in the report. Can I just seek clarification as to whether the directive has to be included um, as part of the um, approval? It, it would be part of the actual decision document. Um, so that it will form part of the, the notice which will go out. Thank you. Take a break, come back at half past. The two wind turbines, these blade tip an associated metre house formation of an access track, an associated hard standing and direction of an anometer mass 40 metres high for a temporary period of 12 months at Kuldoch, Dongland, Kirkubri. Application number 14 stroke P stroke 2 stroke 0152. And Judith Turnbull, if you can hear. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, first of all, I'd like to point out two additions to the report. Um, these are two additions to the list of representers on page 99. The, the first one is Ray Lee um, of Kirkbride Cottage, Gelston, and the second one is our Grennan Manor House, uh, Castle Douglas. Um, I can assure you that both the letters of representation were received on time and have been taken into account in the assessment of the application. Moving on to the first image, this is the application site. Um, 
it's just a, a, repli a replica of what you have in, in the report. Um, the application site's adjacent to the C2 road, sing a fairly single track road, which runs from Roan House to um, Tongland. Um, the application site's about um, one and a half kilometres from Tongland and two and a half kilometres from the edge of Kirkcudbury. Um, the access track comes up from the, the C2. Um, you can see the position of the two turbines. Uh, the site is on the on the western side of Kildok Hill, which is a, a summit height of about 146 metres, um, and the turbines are about a height of 100 metres. So, you know, if you're looking from a level on a level playing field, the, the, the top of the turbines would be about level with the, the summit of the hill. Um, so, the, at the at the bottom of the road, the, the small property. Point out there that that is Marsh Clough, which will be kind of significant in in the images that that are going to come up. Um, also, I'll point out the the boundary here, um, which has telegraph poles, which which you'll see in the images as well. So moving on to the block plan, um, running up from the C2, uh, this is a, a new track. First turbine with the anemometer mast here. The, the anemometer mast is 22 to 12 months. Um, substation here. And second turbine here with a each of them with a change base. Parking. The wind turbine details 48.5 meters to tip, 32 meters to hub, and a 30. Meter um, there's the anemometer mast, 40 meters high, with four sets of guy ropes up the mast, which you can see better than that one, um, and there's going to be a temporary period of 12 months. Okay, so, sub substation building, it's about 4.5 meters uh, square in footprint, 3.3 meters high with a flat roof, and the final color of which is to be a gauge to the application. This is the ZTV. Um, the visibility runs generally um, along the D Valley. Um, it's about one, one kilometre visibility to the east, up to about 10 kilometres visibility to the west. Um, and in the north, there's pockets of visibility as far as uh, St. John's Town of Dilrai. Viewpoint one on this, on this, you can see on this slide here, um, is at the edge of Tongland Village, and I've got a photo montage uh, later on from there. This is a cumulative map to five kilometres. Um, the Kildos right in the middle with the just above Tongland. The, the two um, orange ones are the ones we're considering today, the two stars. The red dot is what our previous application at 72 for a one turbine, 77 metres to tip, which was withdrawn. Um, the red, the red, um, these ones here are Mayfield, and down here, um, Chapman Tower and Barcloy Hill, generally. And this is one at Little Sightland, approved by uh, the Porter's unit. And these are the two that are about 20 metres that, that are recommended. These are the significant um, cumulative turbines. This has been taken from the entrance to Park of Tongland from the A711. Um, and I've tried to mark on the approximate location of the turbines. There's no indicative heights given on that. that let you see how, where they would sit. As I say, they're about um, 100 metres and the, the top of the hill, which I'm not quite sure you can really see in behind, is a 46 metre height. This is um, me, I've been standing on the C2 looking up towards the site. Um, the access to the site is, is at that approximate location, um, and panning around here, you can see the property of March Clue. And um, then what? Then I'm walk, walking up the site in the approximate line of the access track. You can see the, some of the, the, the trees have been felled, and you can see the telegraph poles that I was referring to, which are about halfway up from the road 
to the position of the curve. This is me just at the telegraph poles looking back down. You can see in the center that's the property mark cliff, um, and that's looking across. You can see the quarry on the, on the left hand side. Um, and continuing right up to the position, this is about the, the bend in the road um, looking across the top of the application site over the positions of the two turbines um, and the, the uh, control building. And then this is panning northeast um, up towards the higher land behind. <coughs> and I didn't go any further round to the east because I say it's just the summit of the hill there. So the next thing is, oh, I'm going the wrong way. Going back down, that's looking back towards Park of Tongland, where I took the, the first image, um, and that's panning further round, and it's not so clear, but on the left-hand side, about there is the Kisby Bay Park, just at the bridge. This is the um, photo montage I was referring to, and this is my final slide. And it, it, you can see quite quite lightly, but you can see the turbines um, in the in the top photo montage. So, in conclusion, and as detailed in the report, it's considered the turbines will have an unacceptable impact on the visual amenity and landscape character of the area. In addition, Nats have objected because the proposal would have an unacceptable technical impact on Lowther Hill radar. So for these two reasons, the applicant is recommended for refusal. Thank you, Jared. Members, Ian. Uh, thank you, Chair. What's the difference between this proposal, as far as Nats concerned, and all the other um, turbine proposals which have been accepted and built round about? And the second thing is, um, uh, just for the record, what's the maximum height under the development plan um, that the turbine could be without causing um, infringement of our policy. Um, the, the difference between this proposal in terms of, of NATS and without sounding smart is that they have produced a report saying it conflicts with with their their radar data um, and it's unacceptable. The, the, the actual details of it is fairly complex and involves large mathematical equations. Um, I'm sorry, I'm a bit lost the second part of the question again, please. Well, just in relation to that, Judith, the first thing is that um, the, what did they say about all the other sites? Have they caused the same problem that the proposal here is, is doing under this report that they produced? The second thing was I just wondered what, uh, what uh, the development plan said about uh, maximum heights, uh, if at all, on, on any proposed turbines in this area. Um, I'm afraid I haven't looked at which ones that subject to and which ones they don't and, and how that works. That's not something that I have really considered up till now. It's more of, of where, where the turbines are, I think. David? I was just going to say I'm not there. Maybe you can go back to that slide that showed the cumulative one. Um, Mayfield was refused by the council and was also thrown out on appeal. So for that one that is nearby to the, the northeast, that one hasn't actually got permission. Uh, the only one which I remember getting permission was the whole site from there, and that was one which we'd recommended refusal for, members had refused, and my opinion wasn't a particularly uh, correct decision by the reporter, but nonetheless it was approved. So I don't know what the if there's any NATS objections to those ones personally, but um, we have to deal with what's before us. Usually, there, as a, my experience of it, is there usually is a solution. There will come a finite point where NATS will no longer be able to add any patches, but to look into it further. Um, you need to actually commission them to actually do a survey, which normally costs about £40,000 to actually look into it. They will formally object unless and until that's been paid and they've looked into it further to discover whether or not there is the possibility to have a, a mitigation through just a, a patch on the radar. But 
as I understand it, there will come a point where you, you can only patch so much. As it stands at the moment, this is very much a secondary reason for refusal, but nonetheless, it is something that Nats have objected. Uh, it's not been pursued further as to whether or not there's a solution given the other concerns that we would have about it. In terms of the maximum height in policy, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but and if this is a, a, a drumlin pasture, I think the landscape character analysis is no more than 35 metres uh, fits into a drumlin landscape. Any other members? Uh, thank you. Um, yes, it, the, the advisory within the, the, the ICL landscape capacity study is for um, generally over 35 metres is, is not considered so acceptable in a drumland pasture. This is actually in a peninsula landscape character type. It's just on, on the edge. The, the actual access is within the, the drumland pasture and the turbines themselves are within the peninsula. To just go back to the, the Nats issue, if I could, um, uh, from memory, although I don't think it's in the report, no, but from memory, the, the applicant submitted um, additional information with this, which when the refusal came from Nats, the objection came from Nats, they, they wanted me to check to make sure that additional information had been taken into account and that it was confirmed by Nats again that they, they had sent that information. Any more members' questions? See this? Could we have the. <laughs> Give us. We have Janet Gibson, who's speaking on behalf of Mrs. A.M. Brock. Janet Gibson, Scottish Greens. Janet, you've got three minutes, and I'll let you know 30 seconds to go. I am representing Molly Brock, who has had to go to work. I have her representation here, and I'll just present it. I own and live in one of the houses in the cluster of three, approximately 600 meters from the proposed turbine site. I'd like to comment briefly on the noise impact. In paragraph 4.20 of the agenda, we read that a report from the supporting planning statement concludes that the noise impact at each potentially sensitive neighboring property is not anticipated to exceed the maximum limit. However, may I bring to your attention the ever-increasing noise from the Tongland Quarry on the other side of these properties. This noise can be heard not only outside, but also inside the houses, even when all the doors and windows are closed. There is a constant noise all day, on most days of the week, often including weekends, sometimes on Sundays, and occasionally lasting up to the late hours of the night. So I am very concerned that any noise proceeding from the operating turbine together with the constant noise from the Tonglen Quarry could have an unacceptable cumulative effect on the cluster of the three homes adjacent to the proposed site. In other words, the combined noise impact. Seconds, Sorry? Uh, 
might well exceed the official limit and could adversely affect the quality of life of the people living there. Thank you for the opportunity of speaking to you. Thank you. Uh, members, any questions? Right, thank you, Janet. Uh, Gail Hutchison next, speaking on behalf of Ben Morgan. For three minutes, Gail, I'll let you know 30 seconds to go. Thank you. It won't last that long. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening to us today. I'm here not only on behalf of Ben Morgan, but on behalf of Agrain and Manor House. Our Grenon House is actually my home and it is my business, our livelihood. It very much depends on the scenic view, that's how we market it. Um, the Galloway Hills unspoiled and untouched. The wildlife, not to mention as well. Um, most of the thing, points actually already covered, but we just wanted to put our point of view. We recently spent a substantial amount of money creating a level base upon which to put our marquee, offering the best specifically chosen site for the estate and its surroundings. Should this actually go ahead, this carefully chosen vantage point will be marred by the turbines in the background. As a bride looking for her special occasion to have wind turbines in her wedding pictures, is not acceptable. The wildlife, we do actually have red kites that are running as well, and they do come and nest there. Their young do come back to the same area. Again, I would point out it has been proven that this will be affected as well as other wildlife. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gail. Members? Members, we're now in session. Tom. Move the recommendation, Chairman. Thank you, Chair. Um, just to confirm, the application has been refused um, as detailed in the report. Thank you. Now we've got an uh, item. Eight on the agenda, the erection of nine wind turbines, 85 uh, metre hub height, 125 metre to blade tip, total rated output of 27 megawatts. One permanent anometer mass, uh, maximum height of 80 metres, control building and compound, external, external transformer housing, temporary construction and storage compounds, installation of underground electricity cables, formation of site tracks, crane pads, foundations and associated work in an infrastructure at 20 Shilling Hill Felt Wind Farm near Sanka. Uh, application number 13 stroke B stroke 3 stroke 0260. And speaking for this, we've got Ida. <laughs> Thanks, Chair. Uh, I'll just move straight on to presentation. Uh, the application site is located approximately five kilometres to the south of Sanka and is within the southern upwind area uh, and landscape character type. Uh, this uh, slide here shows the site boundary, or most of the site boundary apart from the access, uh, but the turbines themselves are actually located to the sort of southwestern uh, part of the site, which will be shown within the next slide. So here you can see the actual layout of the turbines to the southwest of the site. Uh, they <coughs> occupy a, an upland location ranging from about 476 metres to 510 metres along the eastern edge of a broad ridge. Access is from an unclassified road uh, to the north of the site there. Um, it would be from the A76 via Elliot Bridge. Uh, and would be from a, a minor road. Uh, the access to the site itself would be from a range of um, upgraded access tracks and new access tracks. Going 
going back to this slide and maybe just trying to remember where, where the turbines are here because the next one doesn't actually show the location of the turbines. Uh, but it do, they do run along the ridge uh, going from Weather Hill, uh, the, the north of the sort of southwestern side, uh, along to Jarmy now and to Black Brig. Uh, within this slide as well, you can see uh, Cairn Kinna Hill, which is about 1.2 kilometres to the south from the nearest turbine. Uh, and you can see it's uh, 554 metres above level and is about the highest point within the area. It is the highest point within this, this locality. Uh, to the southern part of that is <coughs> uh, the Scar Valley, uh, which you can see part of the road running through to the southwest. Uh, and it, there are, it is a very steep sided valley, which um, uh, part of it is the side of, of Cairn Kinna Hill. Southern Upland Way also runs to the, to the northwest. Face anchor, and you can see the red dots running. This slide shows the region of scenic area, and you can see that it it, it skirts round the most edges of the application site, um, extending to the north, taking in the, the Lowther Hills to the north, and um, but centred on Midness Vale and its tributary valleys. Uh, it, it it does one turbine is located within the within the, the region of scenic area, but most are uh, right next to the boundary or, or, or very close to it. Uh, this just shows the typical turbine design, uh, which uh, they have applied for a height of 125 metres to the tip. This slide shows the visibility of the, the turbines uh, within 25 kilometres. The light brown shows where 79 turbines would be visible, uh, theoretically anyway. Dark brown is where 4 to 6 turbines would be visible and the blue area is where 1 to 3 turbines would be visible. You can see the visibility extends into the upper Nisvale area and, and also mid Nisvale. <coughs> um, although you know, it should be taken account of the fact that local conditions will, will restrict visibility due to trees and buildings and so on, but this is just theoretical visibility. This shows the local visibility <coughs> to five kilometres. As expected, there is high visibility within the local area, although to the south, uh, quite a lot of the visibility is restricted due to the presence of Cairn Kinna. Uh, to the, the south here, you can see the Scar Glen. Uh, most of the visibility is actually, most of the Scar Glen is actually out with uh, the visibility area, apart <coughs> from the small area that you can see within the, uh, which is blue. So there is a, a, a viewpoint location at Glen Manor, uh, and we'll, we'll come on to that later. Visibility to the northeast of the site, um, that's taking in the Sanker area and the sort of upper Nisvale Valley on the same side as well. Uh, to the northwest, again, visibility along the, the upper Nisvale towards the Connell area. <coughs> to the southeast, into mid Nisvale. The, the visibility is actually restricted to um, Kilmarnock Castle as well. There isn't visibility from Kilmarnock Castle itself or its immediate surroundings. Um, to the southwest, visibility is mainly from the highest point. Uh, this slide shows the cumulative wind farms within 25 kilometres. So this is existing, uh, in planning and proposed wind farms, ones that are activating. Uh, we are mainly concerned with the, the wind, turbine, wind farms which are to the northwest of the application site. Uh, so there are seven of them that are within the Upper Nisfield Valley. Um, uh, these are a uh, white side, Daisy side, Sunnyside, Sanker Wind Farm, Fair Hill, Fair Hill Extension, 
in Sandy now, uh, where there is a, a cluster of wind farms uh, and, and proposed 20 sterling wind farms be a bit more isolated from, from this cluster. This is the cumulative visibility of the turbines. <coughs> um, so you can see the site there in the centre and to the, the north and northeast is Upper Nithdale, where what you see the, the brown colour is where there would be visibility with seven other wind farms. To the south and southeast, the green areas is where only 20 sterling farms would be visible. So that is a concern itself in that it's going to bring visibility southwards into the more sensitive areas of, of Nithdale. And uh, just moving on to some viewpoints now. So to show a, a plan of, of where the viewpoint is taken from, in this case it's from Menich, uh, which is at the A76 and about uh, 4.2 kilometres from the nearest turbine. You can see the, the turbines there on the horizon, on the ridge, and in the wire frame as well, which is a bit green. Hopefully, you've been able to, to see the hard copies of these <coughs> visualisations as well from Lesson and Members Lounge. The viewpoint there again from Menich, it's a cumulative viewpoint, so you can see the turbines within the other wind farms within the upper this field to the right hand side there. Um, alongside Stirling Wind Farm. Uh, this is from uh, the railway bridge at Sankar, which is a higher point within Sankar because a lot of the views will be screened by the existing buildings. So uh, as you can see here, you can see the centre. This is the easement. It's actually quite well screened even at this point by the can possibly be seen through the turbine screen on the south side of the train bridge and also on the last bridge. And again, the cumulative view is going to be 20 shilling alongside other, the other wind farms. So this is what's below down sunny side, which is in this wind farm valley. And 20 shilling is a, a more of an isolated peak. view from Sankar Academy uh, at the A76, uh, which is quite an open space. Hopefully you can see the turbines on, on, this, on this broad ridge. Um, it should be said at this location that Cairn Tenna uh, is a landmark for some views. It isn't so much of a landmark in the view lower down within up on this field. It's more formed part of a, a broad ridge. And again, the cumulative visibility is similar sort of to Detroit to the north of Sankar. So this is where it's not a sensitive viewpoint. Again, the cumulative visibility. This viewpoint is from the Southern Rutland Way on the approach to Sankar. It's a fairly lower level part of the Southern Rutland Way. It's about 227 metres off the road. So it's not a huge view. Uh, so the views are a, more of a broad sort of show. Fairly expansive views as well and quite open views. But again, the cumulative views of the other wind farms. Another view, uh, four paths by Austin Taggart. This, this is his retaining area. Uh, and then a sort of slightly high up as well, 240 metres above sea level. Uh, you can see here that Cairntina is a bit more prominent on the left-hand side of the turbine. If you compare the wire frame and the visualisations, and uh, Dundalk as well, which is left of the Further north, east, is 
376 spending all the home slightly further <coughs> further away again wire screen which means it's further but it is a more distant view again seamless so the other turbines will be closer to the other wind farms so another uh, an upland location near uh, Sodbury Hill Antenna actually repeated the key antenna and the turbine and yeah, that's not it. To me. This is the goal south of that which she site now south southwest so we're at Gar Water with the Glen Manor, so which is sort of the worst case scenario location within the glen, or at least the, the extent of where the road is within the glen. See it's just one blaze of the turbine which is visible here. Um and you know just at that location is where on the road you wouldn't be visible. Another view from the Garwater Valley. This is at the Sutherland View turbine. The turbines will come above that, that ridge there, the hill ridge. Seeing as you, uh, you have the white height, white to start with the white side of the hill turbines on the left hand side. These would actually be behind as well within that view, uh, so, so that affects the importance of the view. Okay. Yeah. Dunlan Ridge East Hall. So the east, eastern part of the Dunlan Ridge was then eventually designed landscape uh, at a higher location, <coughs> which is east side of the Moss Valley. And you can see key antenna on it and turbines will be to the right hand side of the key antenna. So you've seen this view, there wouldn't be visibility to this other turbine within this view but again that that spread spread of coming southern spread of the turbines and into the area of the car so sensitive. Points in Derosphere, which is a pop area which is popular with Scott and also within the Rishi Peninsula. We have the key antenna, the repeated key antenna to the left and right of the ridge. So again, there wouldn't be a significant visual impact to this. Walk Hill, uh, last visualisation was of Finisterre Hill, south of Finisterre. And see them rising above Key Antenna. So seamless view again, uh, although these turbines are theoretically visible, they, they wouldn't be significant within view with these turbines at 20 shillings, which would be more prominent. Uh, this is an officer and landscape architect photo from the summit of Key Antenna, which is marked by its quite very prominent cairn of the turbine be along the from the ridge to the left hand side. Of the slide just to the right, right hand side of the key antenna. And just panning along, you can see the, the view from key antenna, which the spectacular view of the, the Lyra Hills and of the Dixie Hills. Now, 
of us off the PC and we saw we're not using you know banker just to give an idea of the sort of landscape high point near this two antenna and the lower peak end up and this is a view from the saw up into three star Lane. So different locations from that scene in the visualisation. You can see the steep sided Great Valley. And then it just goes There isn't much more to show you anyway, it's just another view from within the Smith Vale. Uh, but that really concludes my presentation, but um, just to summarise, the recommendation is for using of the application uh, on the grounds of landscape and visual impact, particularly to Cairn and Hill, um, and clear and view clear to Antenna is a focus uh, and a landmark within the regional scenic area. Uh, and also cumulatively, uh, in relation to the, the existing and proposed wind farms within Upper Nisbeal area, and also due to the fact that the wind turbines will be a nice, more isolated feature into undeveloped skyline uh, within Upper Nisbeal and encroaching into the, the mid, mid Nisbeal area, which has been scenically valued and protected. Thank you. Members, questions for Barry? Thanks very much indeed, sir. Uh, it would be helpful, as far as I'm concerned anyway, to have it made totally clear uh, the, the status of the, uh, the NATS objective. Intriguingly, as far as I'm concerned, uh, no mention is made of that uh, in relation to the proposed ground of refusal which would appear in the face of itself to be inconsistent with uh, what took place in the immediately preceding application before us today. Now, there may be a perfectly logical, perfectly acceptable reason for that, but I would like to hear it with your leave, sir. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, yes, there is an act objection to the application, and the applicants have uh, been in discussions with NATS and have come to an agreement on the sort of technical mitigation that's required uh, to overcome that. Um, we did get an email from NATS that said that this is likely to be the case. And I have got the applicant provided a letter outlining what the mitigation measures were and we are aware that we need to be in discussions with NATS uh, and NATS will respond to the uh, the concern that the mitigation measures that are that mitigation will be whether we need to bear forward there is little to be in discussion. So what would happen is that if the application were to be approved, then a special discussion would need to be with NATS to bring it to the, the permit planning commission, which required the applicant to enter into a contract with the mitigation measures to be able to approve. Alistair. Thanks very much, Chair. So to be totally clear then, so you know, while NATS originally objected, mitigation measures mes uh, methods have been put forward which they now find acceptable because after their objection is no longer stand. Uh, so if, it, if this were to be granted today, uh, despite you know the offer of recommendation, uh, obviously there would be a condition put in you know, in any grant to that effect. Would that be a correct way of paraphrasing it, Chair? David? Yes, we received advice from the Scottish Government a few years ago on this now, and their advice is that unless you can establish that there's a reasonable prospect within the lifetime of the permission, which in this case would obviously be a few years if it was granted, um, of the um, radar solution being put in place, you should be refusing it. But what we appear to have got here from NATS is uh, they haven't withdrawn their objection, but they've indicated that there is 
potentially a solution within that time period so it would be appropriate to affect terms of condition in line with the Scottish Government advisement. Grateful, Chair. Thank you. And, uh, um, thanks, Chair. It's actually in the same vein and um, uh, to a kind of lay person here flying into Preston Airport quite a lot, I don't understand the difference between the National Air Traffic Service and Preston Airport. Uh, one said it's shielded and yet not for making initially um, an, a, an objection. Uh, how, can, how do they correlate? And, and I suppose I'm looking for a bit of advice here. It's no relevant now because we've got an answer that I didn't know before I put my hand up, is that there's now things in place to mitigate for, to, to that satisfaction. So if that hadn't been there, how would we have sat here today and then worked out which one do we believe? Do we believe the air traffic control at Presley? Or do we believe NATS? David? There are two separate things. National Air Traffic Service, NATS, actually look at the, the overall international national uh, flights. Now, Lowther Hill, which is the, the big radar station nearby, they're looking at that aspect. Glasgow Prestwick Airport is actually a, a private operation, obviously. Um, but they are also looking at aircraft safety and making sure that aircraft can land at their specific <coughs> airport safely. So they're looking at separate things and they will each have their own um, aspects of looking at it. We do need to consult with both in this particular year. Yeah, member? Thanks. If there's no... No one, no one wishing to speak for the objectors can have uh, Duncan Close on behalf of Sankar District Community Council and is also speaking on behalf of Kirkconnell and Kelo Home Community Council. You have 10 minutes, Duncan, I'll let you know 30 seconds to go. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you <coughs> for the opportunity to speak. <coughs> Uh, my name is Duncan Close. I'm the provost or chairman of uh, the Royal Borough of Sankin District Community Council. But today I'm also speaking on behalf of Kirkconnell and Kelahome Community Council who share our views exactly. We live in Upper Nistail and we're no strangers to deprivation and the use of land by absent landlords. Our two communities number nearly 5,000 inhabitants. And since the closure of the mines some 50 years ago, the community stumble from crisis to crisis. It would seem that we're too far away from the hub of things, and with a few exceptions, industries that do come to the area can be lured away by better terms elsewhere. Despite the problems in our area, we are not dependent communities, and both Kirkconnell and Sankar can boast good public initiatives and an earnest desire to improve our lot through self-help. First of all, both community councils do not agree with the landscape architects or landscape officers report, believing that it does not accurately reflect the situation on the ground or even begin to address the issues if such a refusal were to happen. The wind farm will generate up to 27 megawatts of green energy in accordance with the Scottish Government's directives and reduce CO2 emissions. It is also envisaged that local labour will be used in construction. And the proposed wind farm is completely located within the area covered by the Royal Borough of Sankar and District Community Council. And together with our friends in Kirkconnell and Kelahome, as I said, we have the highest proportions in mid and upper Nistail populations. Our respective community councils are both in support of the project and we have written letters of support as part of the consultation process. And we do not feel that this support has been given due consideration in the Landscape Architect report. As community leaders, we are also aware of the support of the communities. And return comment cards showed that over 70% of local people were in broad agreement with the wind farm. In 2011, a community council liaison group was set up with five host communities, and in 2012, a further four communities joined this group. There has been much time, therefore, for discussions, and over the past four years, the group has met some 15 times, allowing a project to be shaped that meets the needs of all parties. As far as is known, 
the issue of Cairn Kenny Hill has never been raised during these years of consultation, and we find it surprising that it has suddenly become a major issue. We have many fine hills in our area, and I could name them, including Cairn Kenny, all of which could become major issues in, in future planning should this planning application be refused. My friend and colleague, Sibylla Trimble, chair of Kirkconnell and Callahome Community Council said, and I quote, in this report, the council seems to care more about visitors than the views and needs of local people, unquote. 20 shilling wind farm is not just any wind farm. It is a planned wind farm that has been shaped not only by the wind farm companies, but also by the communities who will live around it. It is also the first wind farm in the area where the input of local people might even bring some benefit to the living conditions of these same locals and even point the way to a brighter future for many. It'll be a matter of interest to uh, planners in our regional centre to know that there are solid, well-founded plans already in place to foster jobs, trades, and retain the nucleus of our communities in Upper Nisdale. We are fighting for our very communities. Our plans are clear. Any industry coming to our area must leave a legacy of some kind, whether it be skilled jobs, improved housing, or enhanced lifestyles or wealth for the people. The proposed wind farm at 20 Shilling Hill could play an important role in setting off a range of economic benefits to what is, and I quote, a deprived area. We've seen our mines, our forges, our aluminium factories, and even blanket and carpet work come and go. All of them have left a legacy, if not in wealth, then in people who had jobs and improved living conditions. Now, wind farms may only employ small numbers during construction and operations, but the land can be completely returned to nature when the turbines come to the end of their lives, and there will be financial incentives throughout the life of the wind farm. Which brings me back to the objections and the recommendations for refusal in the planning permission. I have lived in Upper Nisdale all my life, and I've learned to live with polluted land, streams, pit bings, forges, empty factories, and open cast sites which dot the land. And I always say, what a pity that there wasn't a landscape architect's office in existence in those days to stop the blights on my landscape. And furthermore, much of the scarred landscape is only now being restored using public money. I note from the report that two of the main objectors are Mr. and Mrs. Coombs, Thornhill, and Buclui States Limited. It's only a few months ago, in fact, it was on the 15th of May this year, when Mr. Coombs, in his duties as factor to Buclui States Limited, attended the Royal Borough of Sanka and District Community Council monthly meeting to actively seek their support for a wind farm for his employer, Buclui Estates Limited, to the north of Kirkconnell. As community councils, we take a proactive role in planning matters to make sure our communities are consulted and informed on issues that could have an impact on the area and make sure their views are communicated to the planning authority. The lack of opposition too, and the support for this project demonstrates that the wind farm will be welcomed, and we believe this application should be approved as it is supported by the local community. I might add that Nisdale Councillor John Syme is happy for it to be known that as a local member, he supports this application. Mr Chairman, I trust that your committee will look on this application favourably. Thank you very much. Thank you, Duncan. Members? Right, thanks, Duncan. Oh, Jane. Can you go back? Can you sit back now? Can you? Sorry. No, not Jane now. Just a minute. Jane? Uh, yes. Uh, <clears throat> um, I understand what you're saying about the, the land. Has, has, have, has the company involved promised you jobs, promised you? What have they done? What have they offered? 
There is no promise of job, but there is an understanding in the initial stages of construction, local labour will be used. Right. Any other member? No. No, I'm getting this Thank time. You. <laughs> Have you and Hutchinson, the applicant, please? You and your five minutes, I'll let you know 30 seconds to go. Chair, councillors, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. My name is Stuart McAuleys and I lead the UK wind operation for Element Power based in Scotland. My name is Ewan Hutchison, I'm a planning consultant at Natural Power based with our headquarters in Dumfries and Galloway. Members of our project team have engaged with your planners, landscape architect and the local communities on the 20 Shilling Hill proposal since the site was initially identified as having potential for a wind farm in 2010. Therefore, we were very surprised and disappointed to be told in October that your landscape officer was advising refusal on landscape and visual and associated cumulative effects and that the case officer accepted that view despite the committee report confirming that 20 Shilling Hill meets all other criteria. We know that when you consider this application today, you will have to balance competing interests and we are confident that we can demonstrate that the benefits and visual appearance of this wind farm meets your local development plan policies IN1, IN2, NE2 and Scottish planning policy. The SPP, which was published in June 2014, identifies the 20 Shilling Hill site area and the regional scenic area surrounding it as a group three, an area with potential for wind farm development. In the time available to us this morning, it would be best to demonstrate this by looking again at viewpoints 11, 13 and 17. The officer uses these viewpoints to conclude that views from within the regional scenic area towards Kernkinna Hill would be adverse, but at no point has said that this is unacceptable. I should point out that there is no viewpoint for Kernkinna Hill as it was never a formally agreed viewpoint by the Council or SNH. It is also significant that your officer's report notes, and I quote, given the lack of evidence that the hill is of significant recreational value, it is not considered that the impact on this particular hill alone would be materially adverse in the sense that it could be considered a significant receptor. Um, I wonder if Vary could maybe just flip back to viewpoint 17. Viewpoint 17, taken from Walk Hill, is referenced in the report as evidence that the proposal would be detrimental to the distinctive landscape. If you were standing at this viewpoint, you would be 13 kilometres south of the site, and you would see it would occupy approximately three degrees, just three degrees of the 360 degree view. Viewpoint 11 and 13 shown earlier are from the east distances of 7.5 and 10 kilometers. We therefore ask you to consider whether the limited impact of the development in these views is a valid reason for refusing the application. The recommendations are based on views that the wind farm of a wind farm which will only occupy a small arc of view. We believe this isn't balanced position. The approach taken when designing this wind farm was agreed with the council to minimise landscape impacts on the core regional scenic area, Scour Valley and the design landscape around Drumlanrig Castle, and we have achieved this. The design also consciously sets out to present a balanced layout to the key views from the north. The majority of sensitive receptors are located in Upper Niffsdale. These include houses and people that would see the wind farm in the areas of Sankar and Coconnell and Kelleholm. Both communities have had the opportunity to scrutinise and inform the design and both support the application. Another relevant point is that the conclusions in the report are based on a scenario which assumes that Sandy Now and other wind farms have been consented. This is not an acceptable approach because 20 Shilling Hill is ahead of those in the queue as it is being considered here today. 
As developers, we never forget that a wind farm is, at heart, a local enterprise, and that an appropriate balance must be struck between Scotland's green energy commitments and the need to satisfactorily address the impacts on local communities and the environment. And it is because of the need for renewable energy, because of the substantial benefits this scheme would bring to the region, because of the local seconds. support demonstrated to today, to go. because of the lack of statutory objections, and because it has not been found to be unacceptable, that we believe that the 20 Shilling Hill Wind Farm should be supported, and we urge you to approve this application. Thank you. Thank you, members. Thanks, Chairman. I suppose this is for either or whoever wants to ask it. In regards to first for the community council uh, representatives, and, they, they, and you've spoke yourself. I'm just trying to get it into my mind, gauge the, the benefit to the community. Uh, Quite clearly, it's within the consultation, 27 megawatts green energy. Absolutely, it, it, that contributes to 100% renewable energy supplies by 2020. Uh, but it goes on to say about the, the, the construction of it, of labour, local labour will be used uh, at that point. And there, what, what benefits will the actual local area gain in the, both the short term, through the construction, and the long term thereafter? In terms of um, short term during the construction, what we've been doing when we've uh, had our public information events, for example, is, is capturing uh, details to enter into a database of local tradesmen and local companies that could gain work during the construction era of the wind farm. Uh, what we plan to do if we get consent is that we would then uh, contact these people um, and invite them to come and talk to us about what they can do uh, during the, the actual construction. Uh, the, there's a lot of different elements in terms of a wind farm being constructed. It's not just about the bulldozers putting tracks on the hill and also about actually putting up the turbines themselves. There are many, many things that, that happen in the local area around the construction. So, for example, fencing and um, accommodation, uh, providing catering, so on and so forth. Um, in terms of our, uh, the longer term benefits, uh, we are committed to putting £5,000 per megawatt into a community fund that would be administered by the community for their own project. Well, back in, Ian. I just said, that, I missed that last point. Did you say 100k? Is that an annual figure? Is that a, a one-off? It was £5,000 per megawatt per year for the lifetime of the wind farm. So it's a significant investment in the local community. Jane? Um, th thank you. I, I think that's standard practice. Um, could I possibly ask you, um, you, you said as you finished your um, presentation that this was really important and will have major benefits for the region. Um, and you have indeed told us about um, uh, construction, which certainly will be sourced locally. Um, but your own economic and socio socioeconomic study you know, actually says to us that um, making economic impact estimates depends critically on where the development money is spent. And um, industrial components don't come from here. This is your own study. And um, haulage will not be sourced locally either. So we're talking about purely about the element of construction and £5,000, which is standard stuff. Is that what you're suggesting? During the construction period, as I said, there are many different types of work which does need to be done. You are quite right. The turbines aren't built locally. The construction, the actual civil's work is usually done by um, a, a sort of mainstream contractor. But where we have influence is that on other wind farms uh, with other developers, I do know for a fact that often the um, contract is let to the, the principal contractor who then comes in and brings all the subcontractors with him. And what we say to the, the, the contractor is that whilst they may be providing the civil's work, uh, there are local trades who can provide a lot of the, the other um, contracts around that in support of that actual main civil's contract. Yeah, can, I, can I follow on from that? Just Obviously, there's projections into the future. I can only speak on the basis of what's already happened. 
natural power or a local contractor. The applicant has specifically employed us as a local contractor. Speaking to the applicant earlier in the week, they confirmed that they've already spent in the region of a quarter of a million pounds in the local area. Um, I can say within natural power, that has contributed to the employment of 12 different people across dis different disciplines. And I'm talking planners, um, ecologists, hydrologists, engineers, have all been employed in this project over the last four years and have contributed to this project so far. And again, have the, have the opportunity through projects like this to, to be involved in the construction and the operation and management of, of such sites. I know what I'm thinking, Chairman. Andy. Um, thank you. I, I know you used the word civils, and I think you mean civil engineers or something like that. Your people. Um, are you committed to writing into the, the, the contract tender for whoever does that work for you that they will use local um, as far as possible? I mean, I appreciate the wind turbines will be made probably abroad and the transport from the ship to. That's not, Andy, that's not planned this year. Can I just, um, just can I, but could I just interrupt for a wee second, um, just to confirm that the community benefit is not a material planning consideration, um, which this planning application committee can take into account. Um, I apologise for having to interrupt, Councillor Ferguson. Okay, I stand corrected. Any other members? Anything? Ian. It's just a brief one, it's about 1.10, and it's just a technical question more than anything, and just to, it gives me an understanding, because it says that the generating capacity is up to 3 megawatts per, uh, per uh, turbine. I'm just trying to get an understanding. It, I think there's, there's a difference as it, as it goes on. Maybe it's technical in regards to uh, the contracts or difference. I think it is in rocks as it stands at the moment. Just to, it's because it's I'm trying to compare it to what will actually be generated throughout the lifetime, because we have real time. It's, Try to understand what will be generated, generated, what will be put in site here. Just in, I think the size and scale of the actual generators that sit on top of the, the, the turbine mast itself. Do we know what the actual size is? Will it be three mega? Will it be two? Will it be two and a half? What will it actually be? You work at Ian. It's nine nine turbines at 27 megawatts. It's three, three megawatt turbine. Uh, Chairman, it's, what it actually says is generating capacity of up to three megawatts. That can be an entry one megawatt up. That's what I'm trying to get an understanding. It will be, it will be rated. It will be rated. It produces that. I'm not. That's what it'll be rated. Uh, I suppose I'm just. It's the size and scale. I think the different size of turbo uh, generators, different size and size and scale. Chairman, that's what I'm trying to get, get into my mind. So, you want to answer that? Absolutely. Yes. Um, you're right, it is different sizes of, of generators do provide different levels of power. Um, on the site, I would say no smaller than two, no bigger than three. It really depends upon which is the ideal generator for the wind regime on the site. Um, what's good for a very flat site, for example, is not always good for a very steep-sided site. So once we have our, our wind data and we've analysed that, we'll know exactly which. But what we're saying is we won't go any higher than three and we won't go any higher than 25 metres. Jim? Thank you, Chair. We have heard of the jobs which will be supplied by construction, transport work, and the 12 jobs in planning. How many jobs will be created in the ongoing maintenance of the scheme? No. It's not, well, that's not planning consideration, Jim. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, you mentioned uh, during your presentation about the three, per uh, three degree arc uh, visibility. I think it was, was it three degrees out of the total 360 sort of um, panorama, if you like, uh, and how, um, you know, how that could be conceived in terms of the balance of the, the way the, it's presented in the report in terms of the significance of the visibility. Is that, um, would that be consistent across most of the viewpoints uh, mentioned in the actual 
um, report. So the, the three, it's, you're looking at a kind of three degree arc, is that correct? I think the three degree referred to the one the application, the sorry, the, the VP, which is on the screen in front of you. Um, we, we mentioned 17 because it was specifically referred to in the, in the report um, alongside 13 and 11. And in 13 and 11, there is a wider spread, but still within a 360 degree view. What we're, what we're questioning in particularly viewpoint 17 is whether the significance of that impact in your mind, you're, you're the guys who are going to make this decision, whether that, the, the, visual, the visual that's presented before you makes this project unacceptable. Because that's, that's what the policy requires. It requires not just a, a determination of whether the impact is significant, whether it's adverse, but whether it's unacceptable. And that's, that's what we're querying, particularly in relation to that viewpoint, having um, seen it flagged up as a specific reason in the in the report. Stephen, just for for uh, the other end of the spectrum, as it were, what is there? A, what would be the maximum uh, arc, if you like, from you know where would the maximum arc be? Would that be like seven degrees, ten degrees, in terms of a panorama? I've seen projects where you can have a whole hundred and eighty degree. If, you know, you, this you, one, you can have situations where you would be, you know, in a valley with um, with turbines around, you know, the periphery of the valley and, and be at 180 degrees before that sort of threshold of unacceptability has been, been crossed. This is three degrees out of 360 and, you know, it's it's difficult to see where that becomes unacceptable. Thank you. Yeah, I'm starting to be corrected. Do you want to come back in with your question? Thank you, Chair. My question, quite simply, is how many permanent ongoing maintenance jobs will be created? To be honest, I can't give you a number because it depends on the type of um, operation and maintenance contract that we have. It depends upon the type of... Um, management contracts that we have in place and, and who are the best people to to manage those contracts. So I'm sorry, I can't give you a definitive, we will employ X number of people. Chair, can I follow up on that? Both the applicant and ourselves, Natural Power, are involved in the Dumfries and Galloway Renewable Energy Partnership. And these these discussions have been going on ongoing. I mean, the council, the council facilitates that, um, that partnership that involves people from the college, people from Scottish Enterprise, from the Chamber of Commerce, app, uh, developers, local contractors. And the, the idea is to try and um, develop the supply chain in Dumfries and Galloway, stemming down from projects such as, like, such as this. It's not just about jobs and permanent jobs, it's about contracts and contracting opportunities and investment. Um, as I said, our company has been involved over the last three years Full-time jobs, probably the equivalent of about two and a half contracts, but I say spread over 12 people. That's, that's contributed to the employment of those 12 people over that period. Um, and I think, you know, it's, it's sort of skews it to be talking about individual people. Um, we have a control centre um, on Forest Estate up near Del Rai. If any of you um, have been up that way, you'll, you'll know where we are. That control centre manages 30% of the wind farms in the UK at the moment. It manages wind farms in North America. It manages wind farms in Ireland and Northern Ireland from an office in the, the middle of the Galloway Hills. That's what's achievable in, in this sort of industry now. It's, it's, it's not all how many people are, are on site. It's not a factory. It's, a, it, it's the sort of bigger supply chain that, that we need to be looking at and the opportunities that that would bring. Any more questions? Right, thanks very, thanks very much. You can take my seat. You've got your seat. Uh, members, we're now... Alistair. Thanks very much indeed, Chair. As, as far as I'm concerned, so the, you know, the, 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 the clincher, for want of a better term, apart from uh, Mr. Close's eloquence, uh, is uh, paragraph 4.66. 
uh, in the papers. Uh, the conclusion. Uh, the first sentence, Chair, uh, goes, states that although the general location of the application site within an upland area of broad hilltops is, in principle, considered to be an opportunity for wind farm development, and as far as I'm concerned, that is the basis from which I choose to start off, Chair. Basically, what we're saying is, in fact, that this, in, uh, this is considered to be an opportunity for wind farm development. Okay, the sentence goes on to uh, state uh, about the specific siting of the 20 shilling turbines uh, and draws the conclusion that uh, the impact, and let's be honest, Chair, there is an impact to an extent, but says in fact that the impact is materially adverse. I personally don't share that view. And one, of course, of the classic definitions of planning is that it's ultimately a matter of opinion. What I would go on to say uh, is, in fact, that in my opinion, the, uh, the, the, the fact that you know, we're talking about a proposal here, uh, which could quite reasonably be said that the, the benefits, if it were to be granted, would, uh, and, and, and making the contribution to the renewable and economic benefits uh, in terms of the contribution to the scheme, to the meeting of the renewable energy targets, and any economic benefits on that part of our region uh, uh, you know, would, in fact, outweigh, uh, as it were, the impact. Uh, the adverse, as I've already indicated here, to an extent. So to that on that basis, I am of the view that this application should be granted. And I would cite you, uh, Chair, uh, the fact that we are following, to an extent, precedent. Because it's not so very long ago that there was a further similar application further up that valley which was granted by this committee as well. Now, as always, I'll be interested to hear the views of colleagues, but I would be proposing to move, sir, that uh, the, 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 this, this particular application be granted on the basis, uh, as I say, that the general location of the application site uh, is considered, in principle, to be an opportunity for a wind farm development, and that at the end of the day, uh, while there is an impact uh, to a degree, the... Uh, that, that impact is not considered to outweigh the renewable and economic benefits of this proposal in terms of the contribution which the scheme would make to meeting renewable energy targets and the benefit it would confer on the economy of this part of the increasing gallery. And I would so move, Chair. Ian. Thanks, Chair. I would entirely agree with uh, Councillor Geddes on that. I would actually even go further because Looking through that unusually extensive number of uh, landscape photographs with strategic viewing positions, it convinced me, um, since you could barely see any of them, that in fact, actually, this is an ideal location for, um, for, for a wind farm. Um, I, think, uh, I think Alice is absolutely right with the, with the mitigation of any impact there may well be. However, I would go further. And as far as the recommendations are concerned, I don't think it diminishes the importance of the hill, and I don't think it detracts at all from the views of the hill as described in that paragraph two. And furthermore, since it is a subjective thing, um, the, the, uh, I, I would argue that it does not actually uh, significantly increase the cumulative effects on the landscape. And I'll be more than happy to second uh, Alice's motion. That's you. Thanks, Chair, and I'm pleased the other two um, previous two talkers have basically uh, thought the same as me. Um, I think there's nobody more determined than the people that are up on this trail and, and, and moving their their area forward. And we've seen that in the past with the, certainly the, the previous application that Alistair was talking about when we uh, overturned a, a position there. Um, I think that in, in this particular case, I, I don't see it as a, as a as contrary, contrary to the, the development principles that have been mentioned in the uh, in the recommendations here. I, I actually see it enhancing the potential future of, of, of the Nisdale Valley. Um, in, in that respect, I think the opportunities here are, are, are huge within uh, Upper Nisdale. I think the opportunities that we as a planning committee cannot avoid um, making a decision on. So, so with that, with that, I'll be certainly supporting Alistair's um, move. Good. Thank you, Chair. Can I just actually ask Councillor Geddes, I, I fully took on board all the points that were made um, and what was put forward. I thought was a, 
uh, very competent ground for that. The only thing I was uncomfortable about was when you were saying about the renewable energy targets and economic benefit of that way. Can we be clear as to what you're talking about as the economic benefits? Um, well, uh, I, I was talking, Chair, uh, about the, the, the bet. Yes, I see what Mr. Sutty is coming from. Uh, as has already been indicated, uh, never too proud to accept advice, Chair. You know, I would not wish at the end of the day to incorporate anything into a motion to grant which would uh, could be said, in fact, to prejudice that. So on that basis, uh, if you're prepared to accept it, Chair, as competent uh, under deletion of that uh, particular uh, phrase, I would be more than willing, sir, to, uh, to amend my motion accordingly. And I'm grateful to my colleagues. Uh, Andy. Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, I've been very publicly uh, corrected uh, not that many minutes ago. I have to say that the, uh, the evidence that was given here by Mr. Post, Duncan Post, uh, was, was compelling. And if nothing else, this whole uh, process is supposed to be for the public. And if, and I would have assumed that, and I'm hoping correctly, that both at Sankar and uh, Sir Colonel Kelholm Community Councils, this had been well and truly thrashed out. Um, probably in the long hours of the night, I would suggest. Um, and we have to take on board, because this is an absolute uh, best example of com uh, real community engagement where the community are actually saying they want this, right? And it's um, officials who are saying no. Um, uh, I will support Al uh, Alistair's motion. Ronnie. Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, it, it, from the developers, there was a few counter claims and criticisms of the officer. We've never really had our chance to, to, to uh, confront them. The other thing, Alistair made a very generic thing which I was worried about because you don't want to set a precedent. Everyone's got to be looked at its own merits. And the question then you've got to ask is, socioeconomic benefits, I don't know of a single person that's into fabrication at the college. The targets that were set by the government are not getting met. So, you know, there's a, and David's mentioned that, maybe we've got to be careful how we say that. So, fine, we look at it on its own merits, but it's got to be a technical thing, because you've said before the community benefit isn't a material consideration. So I'd like to hear what the officers think of some of the counter evidence and, and some of the criticisms of, of the officers uh, bringing this report. I have never made any criticism of Barry Duff in relation to this. I was done about him, I was on about the, the, the developer. Sorry, my apologies. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I mean, basically, obviously, officers are going to be playing it with a straight bat. The landscape architect is looking at it from her very distinct perspective. She is going to be looking at it um, as a landscape architect, looking at the effect of the turbines <coughs> on the landscape. So obviously, I take on board the comments that were made by the community council, but um, she is having to look at that in her own purest way. What we have done as planners is take all the various <coughs> comments on board and not necessarily agree with them or accept them wholesale. And I think uh, Barry's concluding paragraph that Councillor Geddes has correctly referred to in uh, 4.66, that does allude to the fact that it's, it's not a black and white case. Um, in principle, it's by no means the, the worst scheme that we've seen. Don't, don't get that into your mind at all. It's, it's certainly not. But there are concerns about it in terms of its proximity to the, the regional scenic area, to the fact it's moving the, the cumulative mass of turbines in the upper Nistel area down further to the southeast, and that is going to make them more prominent. That's, that's our concerns, but obviously, uh, again, as Councillor Gares quite correctly said, it's uh, ultimately a subjective matter. That's what we put forward as our view and opinions, but particularly in this case, I think you could legitimately take a, a different view. Jane? Uh, y yes, it is a subjective matter, but you know, only at the margin. Um, I'm quite surprised at members who are prepared to say, on the one hand, that uh, it's wonderful that a community council comes along and says it wants something in planning, so we all fall over ourselves, we ignore um, the Dumfries and Galloway um, uh, wind farm capacity studies, 
We ignore our policies. We ignore our officers. Um, and for the sake of listening to, I, I've heard no compelling evidence, actually. And in fact, uh, Mr. Sati totally spoiled my fun because I wanted to know exactly what was the economic benefit that was going to accrue. I hadn't heard anything constructive or clear or absolutely categoric. I'd heard all sorts of suggestions, ifs and ands, nothing at all. Um, so I am perfectly happy to move the recommendation um, because it seems to me that we are going down a dangerous route here and I would suggest strongly that we look at what our officers have said and particularly our own capacity, wind farm capacity guidance, which we agreed not so very long ago. Thank you, and Ira. Here, I looked at this one and I don't really look at the socio-economic impact because as we heard today, we've had we contributed to 12 jobs where 30 percent of the wind farm energy is here. So we're lucky if 0.1, I would think, of a full-time equivalent actually comes from Dumfries and Galloway. You've got the community council who are looking at it from the socioeconomic, i.e. the contribution. I don't think that's a planning consideration. What I looked at it from today was a lot of the sort of photographs that were up. And to be honest, I didn't see an unacceptable planning reason for not being there. So I would be supporting Councillor Geddes on the grounds that it isn't an unacceptable uh, development in the country. Chair McKay. Thanks, Chair. I think it's unfortunate this uh, application has gone down the socio-economic route rather than the planning route. I suppose if you're looking at jobs, you could say we're keeping Barry in a job as well. But I think for the point of view of the number of turbines in the area, within 15 kilometres of 47, and if Barry could put that mark up to code, code first, it was quite frightening to see the number of turbines that's in that area. It's as bad, if no worse, as what the west is down with St. Rar in the St. Rar area. And as far as I'm concerned, there's a, a maximum number there. And that, to see a, a layout like that with turbines in one area, I think we're, we're getting to the stage where enough's enough, just the same as we've had to do in areas of the West. And I would certainly support Councillor Maitland going, going against this application. I think uh, we've been sidetracked by looking at the socioeconomic, and that should never have been mentioned, as far as I'm concerned. Thanks, um, just to just to clarify, um, Councillor Geddes put forward a motion seconded by Councillor Dick <coughs> um, to approve the application as my understanding was on the grounds that the wind farm does not adversely impact on the landscape and visual amenity of the area. He removed um, any reference to the economic benefit. Right. When I was speaking there, I wasn't talking about what anybody else had said. I was just, it was the tone of the whole, the whole presentation has gone down the road of socioeconomic supposedly benefits and the jobs and that sort of thing. It's nothing to do with what Councillor Geddes or anybody else has said. I apologise for that, Councillor McKay. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I just want to be absolutely clear that in no, at no time uh, did I base any of my decision in seconding uh, Councillor Geddes uh, on this on anything other than planning description? And I went through those recommendations in detail and with the greatest respect to, to, to the officer. She's uh, given us her professional opinion. Um, my argument was this, that there's an element of subjectivity in this. And uh, I would also argue that oh, why would deal with each planning uh, application on its own merits? Uh, consistently in cases where I have thought that this is an ideal location, because of its uh, its isolation, or, in my opinion, its uh, lack of visual impact uh, or relative impact, uh, and I want to be absolutely clear that in no way have I based my decision on uh, any grounds of economics, and uh, and I uh, I'll leave it at that. Thanks. That's fine. David. Sorry, just, just can I run this past Councillor Geddes because that, that was slightly different wording that I had written down from what Julian just read back. I had you down as being the, the general location of the application site within <coughs> an upland area of, of broad hilltops is in principle considered to be an opportunity for wind farm development. 
was just brought in from here. Um, and uh, any yeah, and the renewable energy targets would outweigh any adverse uh, effect, which I am happy as a compliment. Jim. Right. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. I would simply draw attention to paragraph 426. The Nithsdale unit of the Southern Uplands type is a landscape where capacity is considered to be nearly reached for additional development. Now, obviously, there is a small subjective element in that. How nearly reached is capacity? I would be inclined to agree with the Councillor McKee, I think we are at that limit, and therefore I would support the recommendation. Thank you, members. We now have a, a motion, um, as uh, Mr. Suppy um, explained, Councillor Geddes, seconded by Councillor Dick. Um, just as clarification, um, I um, don't want to maybe assume Councillor Geddes, but would that be with the um, a Section 75 legal agreement to deal with um, restoration and TV um, reception and appropriate standard planning conditions. Yes, sir, the standard conditions. Thank you. And we also have an amendment by Councillor Maitland, seconded by Councillor McKee, to refuse the application as detailed in the report. Um, if we now go to a vote, um, Councillor Martin. Amendment. Councillor Carruthers. Motion. Councillor Dick. Motion. Councillor Dryborough. Motion. Councillor Ferguson. Motion. Councillor Geddes. Motion. Councillor Groom. Motion. Councillor Hislop. Motion. Councillor Maitland. Amendment. Councillor McCautry. Apologise. Councillor McComb. Amendment. Councillor McKee. Amendment. Councillor Ogilvy. Amendment. Councillor Thompson. Motion. And Councillor Witt. Motion. With nine votes to five votes, the motion um, has been successful. Therefore, the application will be approved. Sub yeah, subject to Section 75 and standard planning conditions. Uh, just may I leave, Chair, before we go to the next item. Um, this is not the first time we've had this. We're quite contentious, a lot of debate and everything else. And council officers who have been instrumental in wording the objections aren't here to ask answer questions. I think it'd be really useful. I don't know if we're allowed to do it or not, but um, for them to be present, um, we just have a bit, a bit of common sense, a bit of foresight to see when this uh, might happen. Can that happen? Um, it takes an awful lot of office of time for every consultee to attend every meeting. Certainly wherever there's been a single issue which has been very, very relevant, then, for example, a roads officer has attended, as happened at the last meeting. Um, but as a general rule, I wouldn't want to have a whole lineup along the back. It doesn't send out a good message of uh, effective use of council officers' time, to be honest. Uh, uh, Chair, uh, David, no, I didn't mean that. Actually, when a bit of foresight, we can actually see when there's going to be contention and, uh, and have somebody here who can answer questions. It wasn't a fair and very. That's what I'm getting at. Move on. Item 9, the removal of two areas of railway embankment at Nursery Cottage, Dalbite, uh, reference number 14, uh, stroke P, stroke 2, stroke uh, 0343. And speaking for this is uh, Dean. Okay, thank you. Dean. Uh, the application is to remove uh, two areas of, of former railway embankment. On, on the image you see there, there's two sections, the northern section, the southern section, 
uh, the southern section has been uh, severed from the northern section by previous uh, embankment removal that was uh, granted planning permission in 2009 at committee uh, to facilitate the expansion of the nursery, the tree nursery on site. So what we have, the southern section is effectively uh, an island now, uh, and the northern section is the terminus of a continuation coming in from the, the north of uh, the railway embankment as it comes from, obviously, out the image from the north. That's a, a zoom in just uh, to sort of give you a better picture of the relationship of the two areas to uh, the burn on the on the right hand side the the dwelling that the applicant uh, resides in at the top there and other properties on the opposite side of the a711 uh, as you come into del Vita. this is an image looking north uh, you've got the properties on the on the left hand side there Rownall avenue you're looking across uh, on the left uh, an area of, of open space, which is uh, in effect an expanded verge by the roadside, and then in the middle of the in the middle of the image is the embankment, obviously uh, well vegetated with trees. You can't really appreciate the form of the embankment in that in that view. That's the southern section, by the way. And we seem to have a problem. Right, okay, it's not on that one. Sorry. I guess we're looking at this one behind me then. Uh, that's just moving slightly further up this a, up the A711. Same uh, area of embankment. That's the southern section looking across the road. Obviously, that's a, a summer view. And we've just moved slightly north of the, the same area of embankment now. You can see the, the beach hedge that that bounds the, the existing nursery. You can see just about see the polytunnel and uh, looking towards Del Beta in that scene. In this scene, we've moved to the east side. We're in the, the grazing field next to the, to the site. You can obviously see the tree nursery there on the right. Uh, and you've got the, the vegetated embankment. And what we've got in the distance there on the left, uh, the nearest properties are Queen's Grove. Uh, to the to the southeast of the site. Again, this is the the beach hedge that surrounds tree nursery, and we've got the access there just on the, the right hand side. The whole site is surrounded by a beach hedge, and the property you'll see on the next image is just in that access. There, we're looking into the access. That's the terminus of the northern section, as it it grades into the site. Uh, to the right of us there, uh, the, the, the track goes around is the tree nursery, and there's a the property, and the embankment there disappears behind the property going northwards. This is an image on the northern section, uh, looking south along it. The terminus is just through the, you can just about make out the post of a post and wire fence. Uh, the embankment would probably be removed from this general position, just slightly back from the, where the photograph was taken and then graded back into the site. That's the uh, culverted burn that goes under the north, northern embankment. This culvert will be removed. Uh, and as outlined in the report, this will bring about some benefits for uh, flood risk. It will remove uh, anticipated flood, flood risk to the property and to John Street in Delbita. That's the northern uh, boundary of the current garden to the property. The embankment will be removed in line with the beach hedge, but then graded back into the site. And that's an image from the grazing field, again, to the east, over the dike. You can just about see the terminus of the northern embankment just reseeded with scrubby species. That, the northern embankment, once removed, would, would become garden to the property. The southern, the southern embankment would become an extension to the tree nursery. Uh, just to summarise, having gone through the proposal and assessed it in the report, we consider that none of 
there's no uh, all all po council policies have been complied with and in the wi and the wider spatial and, and sense and the the vision for the LDP the proposal offers an opportunity to support the expansion of a, a local of a, a business within the settlement and it would actually uh, result in increase uh, in the benefit for flood risk having reducing the risk to the property and to John Street and Delbeach. Nothing more to add at this point. Jane, members, Jane. Um, I'm just, just, this is a question. Um, I, I see this as the removal of two areas of railway embankment. Is there any issue about change of use in this, Chairman? Is, or is that implicit? Uh, the change of use is effectively to the default position of any land that's agricultural land and the planting of trees uh, falls in with that definition. So um, that is actually outlined in, in Dean's report that it will just be used for something that doesn't require planning permission, the planting of trees. Remember, Alistair. Thanks, Chair. A uh, possible typo, sir, in paragraph 2.6 when it says that uh, work should not be undertaken outside the bird breeding season. Surely that is within the bird breeding season, March to July inclusive. I think it's out okay. with it should say, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay, thank you. Any other members, questions? No. Good. We've got the objectors, Mr. Allen Maxwell. Three minutes, Alan. I'll let you know 30 seconds to go. Thank you very much, Committee. My concern about the removal of the embankment is, is purely a wildlife issue. I have lived in the house I'm in at Wandering Avenue for 25 years, and I've studied the wildlife closely. For the last six years, the southern embankment has been used, sometimes lived in by badger, and they're still using and still sometimes living in it. In this report here, it says no significant evidence was found on that line, but I don't know where he was looking. So I got in touch with uh, Scotland's Badgers, and a gentleman came down and concurred with me. There's plenty of evidence there that there are Badgers living and using that site for feeding purposes. So apart from other wildlife, there's deer, red squirrel, fox, uh, slow one, Hedgehogs, and I imagine there were hedgehogs at this minute uh, hibernating in that banking because they emerge from there at the spring of every year. So that's basically it for me. Purely a wildlife issue and should be left as it is. Right, thank, thank you. Um, members? I Could you just say again about badger? Was it there was evidence of badger set here? Uh, just, uh, living and no, there, is, there is evidence of real estate, and I was up one day, I was up last month, and I found a newly dug and used latrine, very clean, uh, between the badgers. So I know all the signs, and, and I know what I'm looking at. As I say, I've been looking at it for the last 25 years. Thank you. Any other member? No. Thanks, Alan. <coughs> Uh, Mr. John White, an objector. Hey, John, you have three minutes. I'll let you Thank know you, seconds to go. Southern section of embankment falls within the allocated housing site identified in the uh, local development plan. Removal of the southern section of embankment to the level of the existing land to extend the existing nursery and planted with beach hedging is no substitute for the trees of long standing. The local plan states it's important to preserve the attractive gateway along the A711 has not been mentioned in the case presented to you. There are positive cumulative environment effects in relation to minimizing loss of soil. Land at the rear of nursery cottage as reserved housing land. 
CEPA objected in principle to this, this site as located in the floodplain and is not recommended for future development. Previously, embankment removed without approval. Retrospective approval had to be sought primarily to extend the nursery business, and the client took approximately 30 meters more than approved, but no extension made and no persons employed, as was said, would take place. The burn running alongside the track opposite the client's site and under the road joins the client's burn and eventually runs along the back of Munch's care home to join the main burn. Any interruption means backup and would result in flooding of properties along the track previously mentioned. That happened last winter when the fire brigade called to property 27 Ronald Avenue had water to the level of the floorboards. This notified to the council but never reported to SEPA, whom were denied such knowledge to make an informed decision in their assessment of the site. This could result in the council being liable for a lot of money should it happen following work undertaken. A vast area of land that now exists and underused to seek more cannot be justified as the retrospective approval was for a second polytunnel that never was undertaken. A flood risk assessment for Galloway Trees and Mr. David James in that assessment, a road is shown on one of the plans running from John Street to the land behind Queen's Grove. If that road passes over the southern embankment, it is not given as a reason in the planning application for removal of the south bank. Could this not be a forerunner for subsequent development at the rear of the client's site? The embankment earth forms a section on the flood prevention scheme for Queen's Grove, an area for the new Dalbiti clinic was considered in a field behind the embankment, so rejected by risk of flooding. Um, Similar, so it should sorely with 30 seconds to go. These works. Letters sent to the planning department were not put onto the internet. Consequently, you have not been given a balanced picture. It is necessary to look at the plans of the 1970s, which have not been presented as these are in the archives. And I suggest to you, without having knowledge of such meeting, the meeting should be adjourned until they have been reviewed and the site visited by the committee. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, John. Members? Right, thanks, John. No questions. We have uh, Ian Robertson on behalf of uh, Dalbeatty Community Council. Just three, points three, three minutes, and I'll give, let you know 30 seconds to go. Okay. I have just two points to raise, uh, some of which John has uh, talked about already. The reason for removal of the southern embankment given by the applicant as a useful addition to the tree nursery is not convincing as the evidence of photographs contained within the application documentation show that, show that there is still plenty of unused ground space to expand the business. Indeed, some of this space could have become available when another section of embankment was removed in 2009. <coughs> The southern part of Galloway Trees Limited site is part of an area of land identified in LDT as DBT section is allocated for housing. At the site assessment stage, the council's landscape officer recommended retention of the embankment and existing trees to act as a barrier between the development and the road. The southern part of, southern part of the Galloway Trees site is stated previously is part of an area, an area sorry, identified for housing development. At the, site assessment, sorry, at the site assessment, the risk of flooding was thought by SEPA to be great enough to suggest that the site be withdrawn. This flood risk is still recognised in the LDT. Part of the flood risk assessment carried out for Galloway Trees Limited and David James, who wished to develop the site, showed a flooding risk at or near the site of the southern embankment where it was suggested a link road from the building development to John Street could be located. The concern was that a road located there would be at risk from flooding during a 50-year event and flood depth could reach 0 0.31 metres in a 200-year event. This remains part of the flood risk assessment. We do not know what effect, if any, removal of the southern embankment would have on flooding in this area. Lastly, the views of neighbours and the evidence they possess including, I believe, photographic evidence of protected species within the southern embankment area of the Gallaby Trees Limited site were never properly examined and evaluated by the Council. 
Instead, the Council's Biodiversity Officer accepted the findings of a survey carried out for the applicant, which found no evidence of protected species. So we have a conflict of views. It is one of the Council's priorities to be inclusive and ensure that local people and communities are at the heart of their decision making. And that didn't happen. 30 seconds, then, for you. Okay. Uh, Dalbeta Community Council believes that the points raised here are of sufficient concern that planning permission should be refused. Thank you. Members? No. No questions. Okay. Thank you. Can we have the applicant, Mr. Charlie Fulton, please? Same, Mr. Fulton. Three minutes, let you know, 30 seconds to go. Okay. Um, I didn't come with a prepared uh, presentation, but uh, I have a few points to try and address to the presentations we've heard. Um, the presence or absence of badgers um, is, I would suggest, self evident. There was a report done. I don't need, think I need to say anything about that. Um, with regard to uh, the flood risk, uh, and the impact of my proposal, I think it's been clearly demonstrated that there will actually be a very positive outcome as a result of the removal of the northern embankment to the river and the removal of the culvert. Um, one point that's not clear in the uh, report, actually, is the fact that the finished levels for the northern embankment area will be designed in cooperation with CPAC to ensure that they provide that that, that area provides additional floodplain in the event of heavy rain, uh, which doesn't exist at the moment and can't ever exist whilst the embankment's there, occupying a space which uh, nature might have intended it to be. Uh, my proposed use for the southern area, which um, it's difficult to explain all your ideas in an application, I should say. Um, my yard, as it stands at the moment, is all hard standing. In the removal of the southern area, I have the opportunity to create an area of open soil, um, which provides me with an opportunity I don't currently have. Um, <clears throat> one thing I'd like to say about, I realize that trees and their removal is an emotive thing. And as a, a forester, um, I understand that very well. Galloway Trees Limited, in the time of its existence on that site, has produced no less than half a million broadleaf native trees which have gone out into Dumfries and Galloway to um, lend something to the landscape. And I'm very happy to be involved in that. One of the projects I'm involved in just now is in the perpetuation of an endangered species in the area, which is aspen. Um, and part of the propagation pr process for aspen involves root cutting. Um, my intention for that area is to lay out pot-grown parent trees from different clones which I've already collected um, on a soil base which allows me to maintain them far more easily uh, than on a hard standing. And those plants, yeah, they say, they say thank you. Those plants will provide um, uh, parent material for ongoing uh, propagation of those species. Finally, the suggestion that I'd overstepped my remit in terms of a previous planning application, I can test. It's very evident that that's not the case. I'm truly disappointed that I have objections uh, to my proposals, and I would happily do anything that uh, these people felt I could do to help. Thank you. Members? Hi, sir. Could you just clarify what you, what you said there about budgers at the site? Well, uh, again, as a forester, I'm very well aware of the the laws, regulations protecting badgers. I understand how to identify badger sets. Um, in a railway embankment, which is essentially a pile of stones, rocks, boulders indeed, covered with a very thin amount of soil, um, I think it would be a very enterprising badger that made it set up a set in such an environment. Now, I obviously had a uh, discussion with the consultants who looked for badgers specifically, because they had been mentioned. Um, and whilst there are scrapings, and I should tell you that I've had rabbits in that, um, in that embankment for a number of years, uh, there's absolutely no way a badger could develop a set in that environment. 
Um, that's all I can say. Thanks. Thanks very much. Any other members? No. Shh. Members now in session. Archie. Uh, just maybe a question for, for, for David. I can remember a few years ago in Echo Pecker there was a discussion about a badger set uh, at the, the uh, application site from there and how we had to get information to SNH. I just wonder if there's any difference now, now compared to what there was then. SNH haven't made any comment on this particular application. So I'm just wondering if there's anything we can do. Uh, really, all I can, uh, I can't really say why SNH weren't specifically consulted on this one. Uh, Dean can maybe answer that one, but uh, certainly 2.6, you have had the Council of Biodiversity Officer have a look at it and agree with the scope, methodology, and competency of the Protected Species Survey. So um, Dean might be able to shed some more light of that situation. Dean? Uh, just to clarify, we did consult SNH but the, they uh, didn't want to comment, said it was out of their remit. So that's why I went to the Council of Biodiversity Office. Archie? In, in that case, yeah, we'll just go with the recommendation. Alistair? Second that, sir. Anyway, remember otherwise my name, Jim? That's mischievous of me, but I'm curious to know why it's uh, appropriate to ignore the Community Council on this one. However, I will actually also agree with members that this is a recommendation for the review. Uh, I agree with what's been said, and just to sort of comment to the applicant, I hope he takes into consideration sort of nice links into uh, Dalbiti that has been worked on and can sort of create something within his own ground that will replicate that to quite a good extent. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Just to confirm that the application has been approved subject to the conditions detailed in the report. Thank you. <coughs> Going to item 10, the removal of three chimneys and installation of lead flashing at 13 Brewery Street and 16 White Sands, Dumfries. The officer, David Catmull. Thank you, Chair. Uh, the application is before the committee uh, because the, an objection has been received from Lowburn Community Council. Sorry. Uh, the application is before the committee because Lowburn Community Council have uh, raised an objection. The application site uh, is a building uh, with a front elevation to uh, White Sands in a rear elevation to Brewery Street. Uh, it's proposed to partially demolish uh, one chimney on the front elevation, that's the White Sands elevation, um, and to demolish two of the chimneys on the rear elevation in Brewery Street. Right. Right. Uh, the, uh, the, the building the building is a, a, a flat roofed uh, with, with a parapet at the front uh, and the chimney on the white sands elevation is to be reduced in size. You can see it just appearing over the left hand side of the parapet. Uh, one of the rear chimneys can be seen above the Canton Express projecting above the uh, ridge line. Uh, a view of the front elevation with the existing chimney and aerials appearing above the parapet it also shows other chimneys in White Sands in varying degrees of repair. Another view of the front elevation showing the ridge chimney of the adjacent property to the left. And looking down the, the wind uh, or cut which uh, connects White Sands and Brewery Street, you can glimpse the other rear chimney which is supposed to be demolished. Looking from uh, Brewery Street, uh, the, rear, the rear chimney, which you've just seen um, adjacent to the wind, uh, is, uh, is clearly visible. 
And again, a view from Bruce Street of the second rear chimney, the, the rendered one, uh, which is to be demolished. Uh, view of the street scene or streetscape of Brewery Street, uh, again showing the range of chimneys and, and types and conditions. Uh, parts of the three chimneys can be seen above, uh, above chimney. That's the, um, the, the, the large rendered one without any um, any pots. You can see two and a half pots to the left, uh, but um, to the right you can just see the a pot from the um, second rear chimney. That's uh, another shot from Rudy Street of the two rear chimneys that's on the flat roof building to the left. This photo illustrates the condition of the front chimney, that's number one, and one of the rear chimneys, which is number two. You can note the spalled brickwork. Uh, chimney number three uh, is the, shows the condition of the other chimney, that's the one which appears rendered from the, the street side. A plan showing uh, profiles and plans of the existing chimneys. The lower one in White Sands, which is number one, um, and numbers two and three in Brewery Street are in the upper part of the, the diagram. This is the plan showing the proposed chimney. Uh, <clears throat> at number one, the bottom is reduced to two courses above the parapet wall, uh, reducing it from about, I think it's about one, 160 to about 70 mil. It will appear just above the above the parapet. Um, number two, uh, up to the, the left, is reduced to two courses above the flushing, and number three, um, at the uh, top right hand side, is to be uh, reduced to wall height. The recommendation is to grant permission. Members, well, we're going to session. Agree to take it. <laughs> Just to confirm that the application has been approved unconditionally as detailed in the report. Um, we now move on to item 11. Where Chairman, is that the result of flooding the dampness in the back of those no. buildings up there? Mem members, we now move on to item 11 where um, the chair has declared an interest, therefore, Councillor Dempster, as Vice Chair, will step into the position as Chair of the Planning Applications Committee. Thank you, members. We come to item 11, erection of detached two-storey dwelling house and installation of septic tank and soak away at Georgetown Village, former quarry, Dumfries. The application types full planning permission, recommendations to refuse, and the case officer is Lindsay Cameron. Lindsay, will you take us through your presentation, please? Thank you, Chair. This first slide shows the location of the former quarry and the application site in relation to the Georgetown Village Small Building Group. This first photograph has been taken from Georgetown Road, approaching the application site from the north. The former quarry and the application site are located in the woodlands, the rear of the existing houses which front on to Georgetown Road. The vehicular access of the site is to the right hand side of the road. Um, where the front end of the silver car can be seen just beyond the, the centre of the photograph. Moving south along Georgetown Road, this photograph shows the vehicular access to the site. The site itself is located in the woodlands to the rear of the two dwellings, which are known as Dreams and Kelnor, who are located just behind the access in the silver car. Looking west from Georgetown Road towards the site access and the application site beyond, the ground level within the application site is indicated by the dotted yellow line. Travelling along Georgetown Road beyond the site access, this photograph looks northwest towards the application site. The ground level within the application site is again shown by the dotted yellow line. 
Moving into the, the site, this is a view looking in a southerly direction, the vehicular access can be seen to the left-hand side of the photograph where the silver car is. And the generally flat area behind the trees where the blue container is sighted um, is where the, the proposed dwelling house and parking would be. Continuing further into the site, this is a view looking east across the application site and back towards Georgetown Village. It's proposed that the dwelling house would be positioned facing north in the centre of the flat area in the middle of the photograph. Looking north across the site, the site for dwelling is to the right of centre, with the access from Georgetown Road wrapping round from the left. The telegraph pole, which can just be seen towards the, the right of the centre, indicates the eastern edge of the application site. Moving over to the eastern edge of the site, this photograph looks back over the application site. Moving towards the northeastern corner of the site, this is a view to the east. The existing dwellings in Georgetown Village can be seen through the trees. The site access is at lower level to the right-hand side of the photograph. We can just see the, the silver car behind the tree. This final photograph um, is again taken from the eastern edge of the application site and looks down over the two dwellings uh, known as Dreams and Kell North, which front onto George. This is an aerial view of the former quarry and the application site in relation to Georgetown Village. And the aerial view shows um, the extent of the mature tree cover within the former quarry. The proposed site plan shows the proposed location of the dwelling house and the parking area, septic tank and the soap room. The dwelling is positioned to face north. These are the proposed elevations of the dwelling house. And this final slide shows the proposed floor plan. Um, just to summarise, the proposal failed to accord with the relevant development plan policies and guidance, and therefore the application is recommended to approve the proposal for the reasons set out in the report. Thank you, Lindsay. Any questions for the case officer? I've got one, Lindsay. How close to the edge, you showed one particular image or, or, or the edge of the site where it looked down onto Georgetown Village. How far away from the edge of the site will the property be situated? Um, in 4.10 of the report, um, it's indicated that the proposed dwelling would be approximately 13 metres from the site boundary. Thanks, Lindsay. Jim? What is the separation distance between the proposed dwelling and the two houses uh, in front of it? Is it Kaner and Dream? I think it's just 25 metres. What is it, Lindsay? Yeah, again, in uh, paragraph 4.10 of the report, it indicates it's approximately 25 metres from the rear of Kell North, which is marginally closer than. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Any other questions? Councillor Witt. Thank you. What, what's the elevation of these the proposed developments above the, the, other, the other houses? Did I miss that? I think it's 13 metres, what is it, Lindsay? And the difference in ground level. Um, the ground level within the, the site um, is approximately 6.4 metres above the road level of Georgetown Road. Okay. Members, Council Driver. Mind it's still questions for officers? Any more questions for Lindsay? Okay, now in session. No other recommendations, Joe? Would it help? If members of the site visit, given the questions that were, 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 were posed, Councillor Geddes, I certainly would be in favour of that. Uh, say that, that uh, one or two aspects of the case office report which I feel would benefit from being looked at from the ground up. You, you know, to, to avoid you know putting you in a position, I will move uh, quite willingly uh, for consideration of this application because we are pending. 
grateful for that, Councillor Geddes. Anyone want to second that, Councillor Graham? Yeah. yeah. I would just like to say as well that the, no objections have came from anyone in the village at all. But I quite agree that a site visit would certainly help for those that haven't don't know the area. Okay. Any alternative proposal, Councillor Maitland? I suggest we don't go on site visit. Do you have an alternative proposal then? But all I need to do is I don't. We don't go on a site visit. Councillor Driver. Chair, I, I have I have seen in the past where a site visit has been actually quite helpful in, in, in determining. So that way, I'll, I'll withdraw that uh, over the recommendation. Okay. So at the moment, we only have an agreement in principle. We decided whether or not we go for a site visit. Councillor Maitland has suggested we don't. Is there a second for Councillor Maitland's proposal? In that case, Gillian, can you inform the members what the decision is? Thank you, Chair. Yes, there has been a um, decision to defer um, for a site visit on this application. Thank you. Thank you, Gillian. Thank, thanks, members. My yeah. dissent. Okay, yes. Uh, going to item 12, it's the uh, erection of a dwelling house, installation of septic tank, and soak away information of access at plot 2, Lily Bank, Glenhowen, Dumfries. Reference number 14, stroke B, stroke 3, stroke 0525. We've got Lindsay Cameron again speaking at this. Thank you, Chair. This first slide shows the location of the application site in relation to the Glen Howen Small Building Group. The yellow dots indicate the existing dwellings in Glen Howen, which are arranged around the access to Glen Howen Farm. And the area outlined in blue shows the site for which planning permission in principle was granted for a dwelling house in March 2014. The first photograph has been taken from the public road to the south east of Glen Howen. The extent of the small building group is indicated in yellow, and the application site located to the southwest of the existing group as well. Moving along the public road to the access to Glen Howen, this photograph looks in a westerly direction towards the application site, which lies beyond the hedge to the left of the centre. Lilybank Cottage can be seen to the right of the photograph. Again, taken from the public road, this photo looks along the northeastern boundary of the application site. The application site extends to the southwest as far as the trees on the left hand edge of the photo, and Lilybank Cottage can again be seen to the right hand side of the photo. Panning West, this photo looks across the application site which extends to the hedge and the trees towards the left hand edge. This is probably a better view across the application site again looking in a westerly direction. From the centre of the southeastern boundary of the site, this is a view looking north across the application site. Um, the southwest boundary is marked by the hedge to the left hand edge of the photograph, and the north, east, and south boundaries are all marked by post and wire fences. Panning west, this is a view of the southwestern part of the site, and shows the existing boundary hedge. Panning east, this photograph looks back across the application site towards Lilybank Cottage. And from towards the southwestern end of the application site, this photograph looks back towards Glen Howen, the access of which is where the silver car is parked um, towards the right hand side of the photograph. Moving into Glen Howen, this final photograph looks north towards Dovecote Well Cottage in Glen Howen. Um, all of the, the existing houses in the small building group are arranged around the existing access to the farm. 
on this final slide from the Executive Site Plan for the proposed development. In summary, the proposal failed to accord with the relevant development plan policies and guidance, and therefore the application is recommended for refusal for the reasons set out in the report. Members, questions for Lindsay? Archie. Lindsay, can you go back back one? The, what, what's that in the, the two shaded areas? The, the, the south side of the field? The, 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 black, the black diagonal stripe hatching line. It's a herringbone soakaway system for the oh, drainage. Right, right. Any other member? Yeah. Um, what's the status of the draft supplementary guidance? What weight should we afford them? Obviously, the, the local development plan is now adopted, and the, <coughs> the supplementary guidance that goes with it for small building groups is basically a transference over of the small building groups that existed before. So whilst it's not yet statutory um, guidance, it is nonetheless of considerable weight. And given that the small building groups have not changed from the previous ones, then they have been fairly through a lot of council uh, deliberation and approval before. Rone? I think it was a, a slide you showed that prior planning commission, I think it was one of the first slides you showed, Lindsay. Yeah, yeah. Is that the same applicant or is that a different application? Or has somebody changed their mind, basically? Um, no, it's a, it's a different application. Um, I say it was granted in March 2014. Um, the, a previous application on the current application site was submitted at the same time. The, the one outlined in blue was approved and the application site, um, the previous application was for, on the same site was refused. Dom. Right. Members are now in session. Dom. Thanks. Uh, I, th I think <coughs> the thing that strikes me is that uh, on the, the stuff you've just seen there, you're not getting any context from uh, Glenn Howen at the top of the road there. And I really think that, again, a site visit would be merited. And I'll tell you why, because it's only around the corner for the first site visit. So, might as well kill two birds with one stone. But I think uh, a site visit would be merited to put that application site in context with Glen Howen and the rest of the small settlement there. So I'm happy to move site visit. Happy to say. Jane? I'm not going to argue with that one, actually. But what I am going to say is that um, I looked at this and was completely confused until it dawned on me that we hadn't put in that application, um, the, the one that's gone in, because it's not on the front map here um, in, in my set of papers. And so um, I, I didn't really understand what was going on. First, I thought it was um, up above um, above the road, but of course it's not in that corner there. So I, I'm quite happy to go on a, a site visit um, so that I can understand what's going on. Alistair, you want to speak or we agreed for a site visit? Alistair Witt. Uh, has that been seconded by? Yes, it's been so seconded. Oh well, I missed my opportunity, but you know, that was basically. I think some things need clarifying. I think we just really need to say that. So I don't. I wish we'd retained the kind of thing any longer, but there's certainly things that I think can only be sorted out through going through the process. Thank you, Chair. Just to confirm that the application has been uh, deferred for a site visit. Thank you. Right, as I have no other further business, I thank the members for their patience. <laughs> Ha, 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 ha.